All praises to the Musa. Again, tonight's topic is called The Shameless Daughters of Zion. The Shameless Daughters of Zion. Let's open up with the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. Let's start there. Come on. Yes, sir. First book of Corinthians chapter 14, verses 40. Go ahead. Let all things be done decently and in order. Read again. First book of Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. Uh -huh. Let all things be done decently and in order. Let all things be done decently and in order. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Church of Corinth because the Church of Corinth was completely out of order. There was a lot of evil that was going on in the Church of Corinth. That's why the Lord is writing to them right here. The Church of Corinth, the Corinthians were Israelites. Give me the book of Acts chapter 18. Okay. Acts chapter 18. We're going to read verse 1. Acts 18 verse 1. We're going to read verse 1 and then we're going to jump. Come on. The book of Acts chapter 18 verse 1. Mm -hmm. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. So he departed from Athens and he went to Corinth. Jump down to verse 4. Read that. Verses 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. You see that he says he reasoned with he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and persuaded says and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. He persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So the Church of Corinth, it was the synagogues of the Jews and our Israel and the Israelites, our forefathers that grew up in Greek customs. You understand? Okay, read on. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia. Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. He, he says he testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Remember, the Jews is the people in Corinth where, he were, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. You understand? Okay, come on. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. The Gentiles is talking about Israelites. They talk about Northern Kingdom. Our, our, our brothers and sisters from the Northern Kingdom tribes that were scattered. You understand? The scattered Israelites. So in, in verse 4, they are called Greeks. And in verse 6, and in verse 6, it says Gentiles. He's making reference to the same people. He's talking about Israelites that grew up in Greek customs they were called gentiles for instance give me the book of give me the book of hosea okay give me the book of hosea chapter 4 verse 17 hosea 4 verse 17 because northern kingdom was cast off they went into idolatry you understand now read that hosea chapter 4 verse 17 the book of hosea chapter 4 verse 17 read ephraim is joined to idols let him alone mm -hmm. You see what he's saying? He says, Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. Who is he talking to? He's talking to Judah. Judah, Benjamin, and Levi said, listen, Ephraim is joined to idols, leave them alone. Why? Because the Lord was no longer dealing with them no more. That's why he says they are joined to idols, leave them alone. Read now, give me Hosea 2 verse 23. Hosea chapter 2 verse 23. Let's read that. The book of Hosea chapter 2 verse 23. Go ahead. And I will show her unto me in the earth, mm -hmm. and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. Right. And I will say, and I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. You see that thing? Because they had not obtained mercy, because the Lord, according to prophecy, He said, they are no, He's not going to have mercy upon Ephraim, you understand? And they are no longer His people no more. That why? Because they join themselves to idols. He said, now let them, let them alone. I'm no longer dealing with them no more. And they are no longer my people and I will not be their God. But it's going to come a time where the Most High God will send his son, Jesus Christ, to bring Israel, to bring Northern Kingdom back into the fold. So when they were, when they were worshiping idols, they were referred to by the Southern Kingdom, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi as Gentiles. Okay, now give me Give me the book of Hosea, chapter 8, verse 4. 
was there eight verse four because um, Northern Kingdom they went in heavy into idolatry. Okay, watch this. Was there eight verse four? The book of Hosea, chapter 8, verse 4. Go ahead. They have set up kings, but not by me. Mm -hmm. They have made printers, and I knew it not. Of their silver and of their gold have they made them idols, that they may be cut off. You see that thing? It says they have set up kings, but not by me. Who were the kings that Northern Kingdom set up? Give me that in First Kings, chapter 12, verse 27. Okay, because after the split, you understand? Jeroboam, because he, he was he was over the 10 tribes. Guess what he did? He set up, they, they set up kings, they set up priests which were not set up by the most high God. You understand? That's why it says they set up kings, but not by me. Watch this. Give me that in first Kings 12, 27. Read it. First book of Kings chapter 12, verse 27. Right. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. then now the hearts of these people turn again unto the Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me. And now this, this is Jeroboam speaking. He's speaking within himself. He's thinking that, wait a minute, if these people have to go back to Jerusalem, because that's where the sacrifices were performed, because that's where the temple was. If they go back there, they will turn up from me and they will not return. That's what he was saying. You understand? So he came up with an evil plan. Wait. Even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me, and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Right. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, mm -hmm. which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. You see that? So he set up two golden calves. One in Bethel, the other one said he in Dan. He says, behold thy kings, O Israel. Because our forefathers, you understand, northern kingdom tribes, they went heavy into idolatry, which included, you understand, worshipping of sun, the sun, the moon, and the stars, committing abortions and having orgies, all kinds of evil sexual, sexual abominations. They were doing all of that. You understand? So because they enjoyed that, when he presented those golden calves, they did not have any objections. You know? And he set up, mm -hmm. and he, first book of Kings, chapter 12, verse 29. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put him in Dan. Mm -hmm. And Come this on. thing became a thing, for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. You see that thing? Is that this thing became a sin because they were breaking the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods. As soon as they broke the first, they automatically broke the second. Okay, go ahead. And he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. You see that thing? He said, they've set up kings, but not by me. You understand? Because they were worshiping idols. They were no longer dealing according to how the Most High God commanded them. Really? And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month. On the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificed unto the cows, unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. You see that then the priests of the high places which he had made. The high places is what? The altars of Baal, where he was worshiping idols. That's what Jeroboam was doing. You understand? So go back to now, go back to where he was at. Go back to Hosea 8, verse 4. Read that again for me. The book of Hosea, chapter 8, verse 4. Really? They have set up kings, but not by me. Mm -hmm. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Really? Of their silver and, the, and their gold, have they made them idols, that they may be cut off. You see, that's, how, that's the reason why they were cut off. They were cut off because they went into idolatry. And you could not, uh, there was no animal you could use to atone from idolatry. You understand? The, the punishment was death. So that's why they were cast off. That's why the Lord says, you are not my people and I will not be your God. I will not have mercy upon you. That's what is, that's what, that was the prophecy. Until the time where the Lord will show up and it will redeem Northern Kingdom back into the fold. 
and all 12 will be redeemed, you understand, and given the chance to get the kingdom, to repent, okay? Now watch this. Give me Hosea 9, verse 17. Hosea 9, verse 17. Read that. The book of Hosea, chapter 9, verse 17. Come on. My God will cast them away because they did not hearken unto him, and they shall be wonders among the nations. They shall be what? Come on, read that verse again. The book of Hosea, chapter 9, verse 17. My God will cast them away because they did it, because they did not hearken unto him, and they shall be wanderers among the nations. He says, they shall be wanderers among the nations. You understand? They will be wandering out of the way of understanding. They'll be spiritually dead. So now all 12, we spiritually dead. Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, and the rest of the nine tribes. You understand? Now watch this. Now, but the Lord did have mercy upon us. That's why the apostle Paul he was teaching the Israelites that grew up in Greek customs and those that were called Gentiles because they were, grew up in Greek cultures, Greek, Greek culture and customs. They call themselves Greeks and they call themselves Gentiles because they were living among the Gentiles and, and, and accustoming themselves, themselves to their cultures and their way of life, which is not what the Most High God commanded us. You understand? Now, the mercy of the Lord, give me that in John 10 now, okay? Give me John chapter 10. This is the mercy of the Lord right here. Okay. In John 10. Give me John 10 verse 16. Read that. Come on. John 10 verse 16. The book of John chapter 10 verse 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. You see what Christ is saying? He says, other sheep I have, which is not of this fold, meaning what is not part of the southern kingdom. When he says this fold, he's making reference to southern kingdom, which is made up of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. This other sheep that he has, which is not of this fold, he's talking about northern kingdom. The proof of that is in John 4. Get John 4, verse 1. The book of John, chapter 4, verses 1. Go ahead. And when therefore, the book of John, chapter 4, verse, verse 1. You know what? When read, therefore, read. Hold on. Wait, wait. Read verse 5. Get John 4, verse 5. Let's just read that. John, chapter 4, verse 5. Read that. Yes, sir. The book of John, chapter 4, verse 5. Then mm -hmm. cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sika, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. You see that, that Jacob gave to his son Jacob. Remember that, that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. So Joseph is talking about one of the sons of Jacob, you understand, who begat Ephraim and Manasseh. Okay, get that in Joshua chapter 14, verse 4. Joshua 14, verse 4. I'm just painting a picture for you so you understand what the Apostle Paul, when we read in the book of Acts, I'm giving you backup background history of what happened in the past and why the Apostle Paul had to go to the Gentiles, which was the Jews that were in the synagogues in Corinth. You understand? Read that. Joshua 14 verse 4. Read that. The book of Joshua chapter 14 verse 4. Mm -hmm. For the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh For the children and Ephraim. For the children of Joseph were two the tribes. The children of Joseph were two tribes. Go ahead. Manasseh and Ephraim. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they gave no part unto the Levites in the land, save cities to dwell in with their suburbs for their cattle and for their substance. Meaning for their wealth. So now what we're reading here, the two tribes, which is Ephraim and Manasseh, that's what we're going over now. Ephraim and Manasseh, they are the sons of Joseph. Now it's befitting what we're about to read. Go back to John 4. Read verse 5 again. John 4 verse 6. John, yeah, John 4 verse 5. Read that thing again for me. The book of John, chapter 4, verses 5. Read. When then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is 
called Sika, near to the pastor of the ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. That Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. And Joseph, he had two tribes, which is Ephraim and Manasseh. You understand? But Christ went to the city of Samaria. Watch this. Now read verse 9. Okay. The book of John chapter 4 verse 9. Mm -hmm. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. You see that thing? So this Samaritan woman, he's, she's, she's recalling the history of what happened during the time of the book of Kings. What we read in 1 Kings 12. He says, for the Jews, meaning Southern Kingdom, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, have done no dealings with Northern Kingdom. You understand? And the Samaritan woman was, was, was an Ephraimite. Get that in Isaiah 7, verse 9. Okay? Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 9. The woman of Samaria. The book of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 9. Read. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head, not the head. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. Read that again. The book of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 9. And the mm -hmm. head of Ephraim is Samaria. Go ahead. And the head of Samaria is Re Remaliah's son. Like if he... If you will not believe, surely he shall not be established. So the head of Ephraim is Samaria. The capital city of Ephraim is Samaria. Okay, let's go back. John 4. John chapter 4 verse 9 again. The book of John chapter 4 verse 9. Then really? said the woman of Samaria unto him. How Meaning is what? It? The, woman of, the woman of Ephraim, an Ephraimite that was dwelling in the land of Samaria. Go ahead. How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You see what the, the, the woman of Samaria is called? She's called a Samaritan. You understand? Because she was dwelling in the land. She was an Ephraimite in the land of Samaria. So she was called a Samaritan, but she was from the tribe of Ephraim. Okay? So when, they are, when, when, when Christ says, the other sheep I have is talking about Northern Kingdom. And the Apostle Paul's ministry was to go and teach the Jews, the, the scattered Israelites, you understand? The Gentiles, which were sometimes called Greeks because of what they were living according to Greek and Gentile customs, like many of our people are doing today. You understand? Now, go back to the book of Acts now. Let's go to Acts. Acts chapter 18. Okay, Acts chapter 18, I believe it's verse 6. The book of Acts chapter 18, verse 6. When? And, and when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he took his raiment. He shook his raiment, excuse me, and said unto them, Your blood be upon your, your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. So because when he says they opposed themselves, meaning they were arguing. You understand? They were arguing back and forth as he was teaching them. That's why he says, let all things be done decently and in order. Because there was no order in the church of Corinth. There was no decency in the church of Corinth. There was evil and wickedness. Okay? Now jump down to verse 8. Acts chapter 18, verse 8. Let's see the, 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 the church of Corinth, the Jews that were in the synagogues, let's see what they were called. Read verse 8. Come on. The book of Acts chapter 18, verse 8. Really? And, and Christ, Christ, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. You see what, is, you see what they are called? Is as many of the Corinthians believed and were baptized. So they were called Corinthians, the Jews that were scattered in Corinth. They were called Corinthians, but these are Jews. You understand? That's why the Apostle Paul had to go to them and teach them the gospel of Christ. Now let's go back now. First Corinthians 14, verse 40 again. 
First book, Corinthians, chapter 14, verses 40. Rain. Let all things be done decently and in order. Let all things be done decently and in order. Because they were not done decently and in order. There was a lot of divisions in the church. There was a lot of um, division in terms of, I only listen to Christ. I only listen to Paul. I only listen to Apollos, so on and so forth. There was a lot of divisions. There was no order. They were not on one accord. You understand? That's why the Apostle Paul had to say this thing. Now, let's go back a couple of chapters before that. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Watch this. One of the disorder that was going on in the church of Corinth is, was what? There was disorder in marriages. And because there was disorder in marriages, the Apostle Paul had to reteach them. You understand? To remind them the order in terms of how Mary is supposed to be. Who's the head? You understand the man's role and the woman's role. The Apostle Paul had to bring that up again because they forgot. So there was disorder in marriages and family structures were broken up. Okay, read what you got. First Corinthians 11 verse 3. First book of Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3. Go ahead. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And read. the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. So the Apostle Paul had to remind them of the order that the Moses God gave from the beginning. The role of the man and the role of the woman. You understand? Because in the church of Corinth, there was confusion. So it is today. There's confusion in the church. You understand? There's confusion. Man does not know what his role is. Woman does not know what her role is. Especially our sisters. Our sisters don't know their role. And they don't want to submit themselves to the role that God gave them. They want the, sub, they want the position of the man. That's why there's disorder in marriages and the families are broken. You understand? We have to repair that with the laws of God. Okay? Now watch this. Jump down to verse 7. Verse 7. We, what we read in verse 3 is to understand that the most high God is the head. You understand? And then Christ. Then you have the black man. And you have the black woman. Then you have the children. That's the order. That's God's divine order that he set from the beginning. That's why he made Adam first. You understand? Now read what you got. Read verse 7. First book of Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7. For Wait. a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for mm -hmm. as much as he is the image and glory of God. Come but on. the woman is the glory of the man. You see what he's saying? So the apostle Paul is taking us all the way back to Genesis. So listen, it says, listen, the man ought not to cover his head. What is he talking about? Jump up to verse 4, okay? What does he mean when he says a man ought not to cover his head? What is he talking about? Read verse 4 so we understand what he's saying. Come on. First book, first book of Corinthians chapter 11 verse 4. Read. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. You see that thing? Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head, which is who? Christ. So when he says a man indeed ought not to cover his head, it goes into what? Praying or prophesying. That's what the Apostle Paul is referring. So jump back down to verse 7. Come on. First book of Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 7. For okay. a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for mm -hmm. as much as he is the image and glory of God. But Come on. the woman is the glory of the man. He says, so for as much as he's the image and glory of God. So man was made, we, was, we are made in God's image. The woman, she was made in our image, not in God's image. You understand? So the apostle Paul had to remind them because they forgot that. Because they were what? They were moving in Greek and Roman customs. Where the, in, in Greek and Roman culture, there was a lot of what? There was a lot of gender role reversals. You understand? And they didn't care because they were ruling. So because they were the Romans, the Greeks were ruling, they didn't care if the women were trying to be equal with them. They knew that they were in, they're in power anyway. You understand? So, but our people, they started to follow them. They started to follow Greek and Roman customs like they are doing today, following American, Western, European customs. Okay? Now, watch this. Jump down, keep reading. 
First Corinthians 11, read verse 8 now. First book of Corinthians chapter 11, verse 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Because the woman is of the man. Because she was taken out of men. That's why she's called woman. Go ahead. For the man, first book of Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. You see that the man was not created for the woman, but the woman was created for the man because the man, Aram, was made first. Then the Lord created the woman out of Aram's rib. Then she was brought to the man, which is her husband. You understand? That's the order. That's the order of, on how the Mosaic God made things. So these are the roles that the Lord put together from the beginning of creation. But because we are in these last days, there's a lot of confusion because of idolatry. Now, gender, gen gender roles, now they are confused. Everybody's confused. Now everybody's gender fluid. You understand? Is your, they say your gender is how you feel in your heart. That's madness. That's evil as hell. Give me that in Mark chapter 10, because Christ addressed this thing. Okay, Mark 10. Might be verse 6. Mark 10, verse 6. Let's see what Christ said. The book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 6. Read. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. You see that? He says, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Male and female. There's no gender fluidity going on here. You understand? From the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Meaning what? He created man, the man, and he gave him his role. He created the woman and gave her her role. So there's no confusion. From the beginning of the creation. Read the thing again. The book of Mark chapter 10 verse 6. But mm -hmm. from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. You see that? God, them, God made them male and female from the beginning of the creation. Now watch this. Now let's go back. Okay. Go back to 1 Corinthians 11 verse 8. Let's go back there. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 8 again. First book of Corinthians chapter 11 verse 8. For right. the man... Is not of the woman, but the woman Read. of the man. But the woman of the man, meaning she comes from the man. Read on. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. So the woman was created to glorify the man. We were created to glorify the Lord. Christ was created to glorify the most High God. That's the order right there. You understand? Now watch this. Give me First Timothy 2 verse 13. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. Because when it comes to gender roles, there's a big, there's a big debate even now, you understand, regarding the roles of the woman and the roles of the man. And because of this feminist garbage, feminism is of the devil. Because feminism is the reason why the black woman now is the black woman has decided to take the white woman's problem and make her own. And to take the white woman's problem. And bring it and bring those problems in Israel and to destroy everything we're trying to build. You understand? Because why? Because she envies the devil. That's why. That's why we're having so much problems in the community because of that. Now, when man wants to be men, the black woman says we are misogynist. The black woman says we are you are, um, you are anti, you are anti-women. We hate women. We are bossy and whatnot. No, we men. You understand? The most High God made us that way. When we pick up this Bible, we do what it says. We move according to the spirit of the most High God, the spirit of Christ, the lion. Listen, the black woman can, the, black, the reason why the black woman is upset is because she does not want to submit herself to that role that God gave her, to be feminine. Not, not be a feminist, but to be feminine, meaning to be what? To understand her role as a woman. Not wanting to be in the same position as the man because that was never her role. Okay, now read that. First Timothy 2, verse 13. Come on. First book of Timothy, chapter 2, verse 13. Read. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. You see that? Because Adam was created first, then Eve. 
Adam was created first, then Eve. So Adam was the first man that was made. You understand? The greatest man that ever set foot on the planet Earth before everybody else was Adam, our forefather. You understand? So after, out of that, out of Adam, Eve was created to glorify Adam. You understand? So those roles now are being questioned. They are being, they are being hated. Those roles, they are, they are deemed as evil and the black woman has joined that thing. She supports it, you know, directly or indirectly. You understand? Spiritually and physically, directly or indirectly, she supports it because she does not want to submit herself to the role that God gave her. By default, she supports the feminist movement. By default, if any sister who does not want to submit herself to the role that God gave her, God gave her by default, she's a feminist. By default, she's against the nation of Israel. She's against the building up of the 12 tribes of Israel so we can come out of captivity and rule the earth. By default. Now watch this. Give me the book of Tobit 8 verse 6. Okay? Tobit 8 verse 6. Watch this. The book of Tobit, chapter 8 verse 6. Read. Thou madest Adam and gavest him Eve, his wife, for an helper and stay. Mm -hmm. Of them came mankind. Thou hast said, it is not good that man should be alone. Let us make unto him an aid like unto himself. So now what you are seeing here says, Thou madest Adam and gave him Eve, his wife. There was, letting you know, there was no girlfriend and boyfriend going on, even from the time of Adam. That's why it says, thou madest Adam and gavest him Eve, his wife, not his girlfriend, no, his wife, for an helper and stay. Let's deal with that part, for an helper. Give me that in Proverbs 14, verse 1. You understand? So when Eve was created out of Adam, she was created to be an helper. Let's see what that means. Proverbs 14, verse 1. Get that. Come on. Come on, Soldier John. Proverbs 14, verse 1. Pay attention. Yes, sir. The book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verses 1. Read. Right. Every wise woman buildeth a house, but the foolish plucketh it down with their hands. You see what the Bible is saying? It says, every wise woman buildeth her house. A wise woman will build her house based on the instruction that she received from her husband. You understand? And this goes, goes for both married and unmarried sisters. You are married, guess what? Your job is to build the house that, you know, the build the house, to help build the house with your husband. You understand? When your husband gives you the vision for the house, so this is how the plan is going to look like in terms of our household. This is how we're going to do things because of X, Y, and Z. Your job is to support that. You support the building of that man's house. You understand? So, but a foolish one will pluck it down with their hands. Meaning what? She'll second guess you at every step. You say this, she says something else. You say this, she says something else. She's second guessing you. Why? Because she wants the role of the man. She won't directly outright tell you, but you have to pull every precept in the Bible to convince her, listen, this is what I'm saying and this is how we're going to roll. She says no. But she won't say no. She will what? She will throw tantrums. She'll do things indirectly to interfere with the building up process. That's a foolish woman right there. You understand? Okay, read the part again, verse 1. The book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 1. Every Ray. wise woman buildeth a house, but mm -hmm. the foolish plucketh it down with their hands. But the foolish will pluck it down with their hands. The foolish will pluck the house down. That's what the Lord is telling us right there. So when you second guess your husband, every decision he makes, you are not in help meet. You are not a help that is good for him. That's why we're reading here says, Thou madest Adam and gavest him Eve, his wife, for an helper. You're supposed to and help. You're supposed to be an asset to your husband. You understand? You're not supposed to be a liability. You're supposed to be an asset. 
So when you say stuff, she second guesses you. That's not an asset. That's a liability. You understand? She's going to cause you problems. That's what we're reading here. A wise woman will help build. But the evil woman will help to destroy. When you build, she'll come behind you and destroy. You understand? She will pluck the house down that you're trying to build. Meaning what? She's counter-revolutionary. Understand that. Go back to Toby. Toby chapter 8 verse 6. Read. Thou made us Adam and gavest him Eve his wife for an helper and stay. Stop right there. He says, thou made us Adam and gave us him, Eve, gave us him Eve his wife for an helper and stay. What does that mean? And a stay. Watch this. Give me the book of Judges 5 verse 9. He says, for an helper and stay. What that mean? For an helper and stay. Judges chapter 5 verse 9. Read what you got. Come on. Judges chapter 5 verse 9. Read. My heart is toward the governors of Israel that mm -hmm. offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. You see what he said? He says, my heart is towards the governors of Israel. Because a governor, there's a government in, in order for them. There must be a government in order for them to govern. The governors are the leaders. So our foremother Deborah says her heart is towards the governors, meaning the leaders of Israel. What was she doing? She supported the men of Israel. So guess what? When it says, when, when we read in Tobit, when it says, thou, 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 thou made us Adam and gave us Eve, his wife, for an helper, meaning she must be an help meet, meaning a help good for him, meaning she was help build the house that the, her Lord is, is building. That's her job because she's using wisdom. She understands that me and my Lord, we must be one flesh. Meaning what? My mind must be according to his mind. The minute you second guess everything he's saying, your mind is not according to his mind. Your mind is according to the mind of your oppressor. Because he's adverse. He's adverse. He's counter-revolutionary. So when you counter-revolutionary, you have a heathen, you are heathen-minded. You understand? So our foremother Deborah here, she's teaching our sisters where their mindset must be. Your mindset must be towards the governors of Israel. That's what we're reading here. Read again, verse 9. Judges chapter 5, verse 9. Mm -hmm. My heart is toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. You see that thing? Bless ye the Lord. So that's what her, her mindset was towards the governors of Israel. You understand? So that's when it says, and help her and a stay. She supported the troops. You understand? She supported the troops. And our foremother Eve, before all hell broke loose, her job supported, she supported who? Adam, our forefather. You understand? She supported him. Now let's get the definition of the word stay. Let's get that definition. Let's get the definition of the word stay. Watch this. Uh, read that. The definition. The definition of stay. We're going to read Fair. definition. We're going to read this one. We're going to read definition five. Literally. Read that. The definition of stay. Definition five. Literary. Support or prop up. You see that? Support or prop up. Support or prop up. That's what it means. And helper and stay. To support your husband. Encourage him. You understand? That's what he's going into when he says, and helper and stay. You must support your husband. Now watch this. Hmm. Give me the book of Sirach. Okay, give me Ecclesiasticus. Give me Sirach chapter 25. Give me Sirach chapter 25, verse 23. Watch this. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 25, verse 23. Wait. A wicked woman abated the courage. Meaning what? She abated, meaning she will discourage you. When she plucked the, plucked the house down, she abated your courage. Okay, go ahead. Make it a heavy countenance and a wounded heart. Meaning she will stress you out. He says she makes a heavy countenance 
and a heavy mind. Now you've got stress where you're supposed to have a pillar of rest. Now you've got a pillar of stress. Go ahead. A woman that will not comfort her husband in distress maketh weak hands and feeble knees. You see that thing? That's not a wise woman. That's a foolish woman right there. It says a woman that will not comfort her husband in distress. You understand? We're already in captivity. That's the main distress that we're in. You understand? And over and above that, we've got other stresses that we're dealing with as men. What are those stresses? Because the black, everybody's against the black man, including the black woman. You understand? So it says a woman that will not comfort her husband in distress maketh weak hands and feeble knees. Meaning what? She discourages in terms of you building the 12 tribes of Israel. She's not an asset. She's a liability. That's what the Lord is saying right there. So go back to Tobit 8, verse 6 again. Tobit, chapter 8, verse 6. Read. Thou madest Adam and gavest Eve, his wife, for an helper and stay. For an helper and stay. And helper and stay. You understand? Meaning what? You're supposed to be that wise woman that receives instruction from your husband. And your mind must be according to his mind. And you must be as a support system for him as well. Why? Because we've got a heavy load that we need to deal with. Us against the world. Literally. You understand? So now that goes for the married woman. And it also goes into what? It goes into the unmarried woman. The sisters. You understand? When it comes to the sisters, I'm gonna the sisters that are unmarried, I'm gonna deal with it in a second. Okay, now watch this. Now, what you need to understand is that keep reading, finish that verse, Tobit 8, verse, verse 6. Tobit chapter 8, verse 6. Go ahead. Thou made us Adam and gave us Eve his wife for an helper in stay. Mm -hmm. Of them came mankind. Thou hast said, It is not good that man should be alone. Let us make unto him an aid like unto himself. You see the thing? Let us make unto him an aid and help like unto himself. Now watch this. Remember now, keep in mind, everything that, that Eve knew is because of Adam taught her everything that she knows. Everything that she knew is because of what Adam did. Adam's job was to teach Eve, you understand, everything that he knew. So that she can be a what? She can be an helper and a stay. So that they, they too can be one flesh. That's why he had to teach his wife. That they can be in the same mind, the same spirit, the same judgment. To see and think the same way. You understand? Her mind be according to her husband's mind. So now, watch this. Remember, give me the book of Genesis 2.21 because we just read we read it here in Tobit, because Tobit is repeating. Uh, in Tobit, you know, Tobias is repeating what we, we always read in Genesis 2.21 to verse 24. Now, in Genesis 2.21 to 24, it gives you more details of what happened. Okay? Now, watch this. Really, Genesis 2.21, we're going to read down to verse 24. But I want to show you that Adam was given what? Adam was given a wife. But before Adam was given a wife, he was given wisdom. He was given a place and he was given a place to stay and a job to maintain the kingdom. You understand? That is, that's the, these are the three things that was given before Eve showed up on the scene. Now, give me, give me that. Genesis 2, 21. Read that. Genesis chapter 2, verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. Mm -hmm. Read. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Mm -hmm. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So that's what Tobias was saying that we read in Tobit 8 verse 6. You understand? So Eve was taken out of Adam's rib. Go ahead. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. She was taken out of man. That's what the word woman means. Out of man. She was taken out of us. You understand? The woman was taken, uh, the black woman Eve was taken out of us, the man. But today, the same woman that was taken out of us 
Now she's a stranger to us and we are a stranger to her. Because of what? Some, some, something and someone got in between the black man and the black woman to separate them. When the law says, what therefore what God joined together, let no man put asunder. Let no man put asunder. And that's exactly what happened. The minute when they were not on the same on one accord, then there was a man that came and put them asunder. You understand? Because there was division. The minute where there's division in the house, that means Satan is in the midst. Understand that. You see how today we've got broken families, disorder in marriages is because Satan is in the midst. Understand that thing. Okay, go ahead. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall mm. cleave unto his wife yeah. and they shall be one flesh. And they shall be one flesh. They shall be one flesh. One flesh, meaning what? You must all think and speak and think the same way. Based on what? Based on the mind of the husband, your mind must be according to his. That's your job. You understand? Your job, you have to work hard to pattern yourself according to his mind. His job is to work hard to pattern his self according to the mind of Christ. You understand? That's the order. Once we understand our roles, we submit ourselves to those roles that the Lord gave us, there's not going to be confusion in terms of building the nation. There's not going to be disorder in marriages or broken family structures where men and women don't know what their role is and how they support themselves to what? To perform in those roles. The reason why you see confusion today is because in marriages, men and women, the Satan is in the midst. One of you is worshiping Satan. You understand? Now watch this. Um, give, me, give me the book of Genesis 2. Because what you need to understand is that everything that Eve knew uh, is because Adam taught his wife. She was taught by Adam. Okay, Genesis 2 verse 7. Read that. We're going to read to verse 9. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. Mm -hmm. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and yes. breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And Wait. man became a living soul. So Adam was given wisdom. After he was created, he was given wisdom. Go ahead. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. You see that thing? He planted a garden eastward and he put the man over there. So Adam was given a place to stay. Okay, go ahead. And out of the ground, God, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Mm -hmm. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of knowledge of good and evil also. So now Adam, because of Genesis 2 verse 7, Genesis 2 verse 9 is telling Adam the do's and don'ts based on the wisdom that he now has. This is what you can do. This is what you cannot do. So Adam is being given what common sense. He's been given the sense. What to do and what not to do. The do's and don'ts. Okay. Now jump down to verse 15 now. Read that. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. Mm -hmm. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. You see that? To dress it and to keep it. Now Adam is given a job now. Adam was given wisdom. And he was with that wisdom, he was given what to do and what not to do. Then he was given a place to stay. Then the Lord is giving him a job. Okay, go ahead. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Come on. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You see what he's saying? Again, he's repeating himself again based on the wisdom he was given in verse 7. The do's and the don'ts in verse 9. 16 and 17, he's being given the do's and the don'ts. Do this, don't do that. You may freely eat of all the trees in the garden because of Genesis 1.29. You understand? But he says, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Don't touch that thing. 
whether he says, lest he die. He said, don't go anywhere near there. You understand? This tree that was the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the tree that it says, don't eat the fruit of that tree. What is he talking about? Don't eat of the fruit of that tree. Watch this. Because remember now, hmm, no, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. Give me Genesis 3 verse 1. Genesis 3 verse 1. Let's keep it simple. I'm going to keep it simple this day because there's a couple of things I want to touch on. Genesis 3 verse 1. Read what you got. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Mm -hmm. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You see what the question is? Now the serpent is introduced. The serpent is in the midst now. It says, He's questioning Eve. He says, Has God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Remember, She's, he's asking the question that he's asking the question of the in, regarding the information that was given to Adam regarding the do's and don'ts. And Adam told his wife Eve. Now the serpent is asking the question to test to see if does this is this woman okay with it? Because the serpent picked up what well, she's not okay with this thing. She don't want that. Because remember, Adam was a god on earth. You understand? He was glorious to look upon. He was imperfect he was he there was no blemish in him he was perfect he was the reflection of god's perfection and beauty and might and power everything was put in adam understand that so when he's the serpent is looking at this man is looking at this woman is like mm, mm, mm. this is the representation of god's power on earth the black woman empowered because the black man was in power and a god on earth and guess what Eve didn't like that. Eve was envious of her of her own husband. You can't make it up here. Now watch this. Um, read verse one again. Genesis chapter three, verse one. Mm -hmm. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You see. The question is being asked. Next verse. Go ahead. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Mm -hmm. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. You see that? Ye shall not eat of it. You understand? Don't eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Because to touch it meaning what? you learn of the fruit that coming from that tree. Now watch this. Now, remember now, Eve is married at this point. You understand? Eve is married. So I'm going to deal with that some more because marriage is a strong foundation for, the, for a strong marriage. So we need to deal with that stuff. Okay? Now watch this. Okay, all praises to the Lord. Now watch this. Give me, give me the book of 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. I'm going to show you something here because... There is, I'm, I'm going to show you there's a point where I'm bringing this out. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. Let's read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. Go ahead. For God is not the author of confusion, mm -hmm. but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Remember, it says, it says God is not the author of confusion. Right? God is not the author of confusion but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now watch this. Hmm. I'm going to show you something, right? Watch this. Go back to Genesis 2.24. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Mm -hmm. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they shall be one flesh. This is marriage, right here. So Aram is defining what marriage is going to look like going forward based on the marriage that he has. So he's speaking from experience on how marriage is supposed to be. The two of you must be one flesh on one accord. So guess what Aram was establishing? The church. That's what Aram was establishing, the church. That in the church, which begins in your house with your wife and your, with you and your wife, that's the church. He says the church must not be in confusion. 
because we know the church represents Christ in the 12 tribes of Israel. So you, you, and, and you and your wife, you represent Christ and the wife represents the disciple. You understand? That's the church right there begins in your house. So Aram is describing the church right here. Now the apostle Paul, he's quoting Genesis because he's going back to how that church must be between men and women. Now it also goes into the, con the congregation now. Now go back to where it was at. First Corinthians 4, read verse 33 again. First Corinthians. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. Right. For God is not the author of confusion, but mm -hmm. of peace, as in all churches of the saints. And the church begins in your house, you and your wife, husband and wife. That's the beginning of the church. Okay. He says there must not be confusion. So what brings the confusion in the church, in the marriage? Because that's the church. You understand? That's the beginning of the church, your marriage. Watch this. Give me the book of Isaiah. Okay. Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah 45, 16. Read that. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 16. Read. They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. You see that thing? Is that they are going to be ashamed and confounded, meaning confused. They don't understand basic things like roles that the Lord has set up. It says all of them, they shall go into confusion together that are makers of idols. Because if one of you is worshiping an idol, hence the confusion, both of you are all going to be confounded. That house is going to be destroyed. You understand? That's what he's saying. That house is going to be, their, their house is going to be destroyed. That's what the Lord is saying right there. You understand? Read it again. Verse 16. Isaiah, Come chapter, on. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 16. They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together. They are makers of idols. Okay, read that again. I'm sorry. Read it again. Verse, verse 16. Sir, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 16. They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. Give me that in Wisdom of Solomon chapter 14. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 14. We're going to read verse 23. Because King Solomon addressed this thing. Okay, Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14, verse 23. Read that. You know what? Let's, let's just get to the point. Read, get to the point. Read verse 24. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14, verse 24. They kept neither lives nor marriages any longer undefiled. Mm -hmm. But either one slew another treacherously or grieved him by adultery. You see that? It says they kept neither lives, meaning they did not keep their lives nor their marriages any longer undefiled. Because what's bringing the, the defiling in the, in, the, in the marriage? Idolatry, idols, idol worship. Because that's what brings confusion. That's why the marriage becomes defiled because of that. It says, it says what the next thing is, but either one slew another traitors, meaning what? There is going to be betrayal or grieved him by adultery. That's another betrayal that will come. If, they, if one spouse does not repent from idol worship. You understand? Okay, go ahead. Read, read verse 26 now. Watch this. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14, verse 26. Disquieting of good men, forgetfulness of good turns, defiling of souls, changing of kind, Disorder in marriages, adultery, and shameless uncleanness. You see that? Disquieting of good men, forgetfulness of good turns, defiling of souls, you understand? Changing of kind, meaning role reversals. Men and women confused about their roles according to how they were set up from the beginning. Disorder in marriages, role reversals, gender fluidity. That's what we're reading here. Adultery and shameless uncleanness. Why is 
Why will this happen that we read in verse 24 and 26? Next verse. Go ahead. For the worshiping of idols not to be named is the beginning, the cause, and the end of all evil. Because of idolatry, worshiping of idols, breaking of the first and second and third commandment. You understand? And you break in the 10th commandment all the way up. Because now you're going to commit adultery. Now you will lie. You, you understand? You will hate your brother. You will hate your sister because of that thing. That's what we read in right there. Now there's, deep, there's what? There's confusion in the house. Now go back to where he was at. First Corinthians 14. Read verse 33 again. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. Read. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. You see that thing? The Lord is not the author of confusion. What brings the confusion? Idolatry. What brings the confusion? You understand? Hating, hating the order that the Lord has set up in terms of your marriage. You understand? That's why it says, but of peace, because the Lord called you to peace. It says, as in all the ch all churches of the saints. Because Adam's marriage, that was the beginning of the church right there. Understand, that was the beginning of the church. You understand? And there must not be confusion in the church. Keep reading. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34. No, 14. 14, verse 34. Come on. Excuse me, sir. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. Right? Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak but they are commanded to be under obedience as also says the law. They are commanded to be under obedience. Obedience to who? Their husbands. They are commanded to be under obedience to their husbands. The reason why the Apostle Paul had to emphasize this, remember now, there were disorder in marriages. There was disorder and there was indecency in the church. So now, the reason why there was disorder in the church there was indecency in the church is because there was disorder in the marriages of the people that came to the congregation so now because their marriages are defiled the church will be defiled as well that's what he's saying right there so that's why it says that the women keep silence in the churches because they're the ones when they open their mouth they what if their mind is their mind is not well instructed they're going to open their mouth to cause confusion in the church to bring what idolatry. You understand? Keep reading. Read verse 35. Watch this. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Mm -hmm. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. You see what he's saying? It's as if they will learn anything. They want to learn anything when it comes to the scriptures, you know, how to conduct themselves and all that. They will ask their husbands at home. I'm going to go back to Genesis 3. I'm going to show you something with that. It says they will ask their husbands at home. You, you see that thing? Now keep reading. Watch this. Verse 36. What? Came the word of God out of from you? Or came it unto you only? You see what the, the apostle Paul is asking now? He says, what? Came the word of God out from you? He says, did the word of God come from you? Were you the ones that were set up to teach? No. Were you the one that was set up to raise up the 12 tribes, to raise up the nation? No. That's why he's, asking, he's talking to the women. He says, came the word of God out from you. Were you the ones that the Lord called to bring the truth to the 12 tribes? No. He's telling themselves, or came it unto you only, or came it unto you. Meaning the word of God was delivered unto you. By who? The man that the Lord calls in this truth. You understand? The most that God calls men. This God's movement, the men are the leaders. Understand that? That's why we're reading here. It says, the word of the word did not come from the women. It came from the men. To the men and the women in the congregation. To set up order in the nation. That's what we're reading right there. But you see that part? Read verse 35 now again. Jump up to verse 35. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 35. Mm-hmm. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Because it is a shame. Because the woman 
if she wants to learn anything, she must go to her husband. If she does not go to her husband, she's going to bring shame to your house. Now, watch this. Now, let's go back to Genesis 3, verse 1 and 2. Hmm. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Really? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest he die. You see what he's saying? So now the woman, because she knows that she's supposed to learn from her husband, the reason why she was able to respond to this, the way, to respond to the serpent the way that she did, was because where did she learn this from? She learned this from her husband. Like we read in 1 Corinthians 14, if she will learn anything, let them, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. So just like she learned when she was created out of Adam, she was supposed to what? She was supposed to not entertain the serpent at all. She wasn't supposed to entertain him. Why? Because, because everything she knows, she was taught by her husband. Now she's entertaining the serpent. You have to think about that. Here you are, you have a married woman. She's entertaining the serpent. Because back then, it happened back then, and it's happening today. How will she, how is she, how is our sisters entertained? We're talking about married sisters in the truth and married sisters in the world. Because somehow, for some ungodly reason, the sisters in the truth married, they have the same mindset as the sisters in the world, the feminist mindset. So now. The married, the married women in the they are not married to their husbands. The married women in the truth, they are not married to their husband. They are married to the serpent. Hence the mindset. You see that thing? That's what we're reading here. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go into details account of what I mean by that. Keep reading. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. What did the serpent say? Ye shall not surely die. You're not going to die, meaning whatever you, whatever Adam taught you, it's a lie. It's wrong. It's a lie. Whatever, Adam, whatever it is that Adam taught you, it's a lie. I got something better. Okay, go ahead. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You see what he's saying? He says, for God does know that in the day you eat thereof, meaning you learn, you learn of this. It says, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And ye, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, the serpent, what is he proposing here? But remember now, in verse 4, it says, you shall not surely die. Excuse me. Verse 5 says, you're going to be as a god, knowing good and evil. So what I want to show you here is Eve, Eve didn't, didn't, didn't like being told what to do by her husband. So the serpent was like, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you something better than what your husband taught you. And that thing that I'm going to teach you is going to be better than what your husband has taught you and what your husband knows and you're going to be equal or above him. That's what the serpent is, is proposing to Eve. But she's supposed to know that if she wants to learn anything, like if she learned everything she knows at this point, she's supposed to go back to where she learned. You understand? But because, because, because it's, like, it's like this, it's like this, right? You ever notice where, no, no, it's like, the way he, the way your 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 husband Adam taught you, he's teaching you just he can be above you. He's teaching you that he can control you. He's teaching you that that's why you hear these trigger words. No, he's controlling. No, he's bossy. No, he's this. No, all of his sexist. No, he doesn't. He doesn't want women to challenge him. That these are the trigger words, by the way. When you hear stuff like that, 
that's got nothing to do with it. It's got nothing to do with anything, but they hate the position that God has put on the black man. Understand that. And it's the same mindset as the sisters. The same mindset that the, the, the mindset the sisters have is the same mindset that Esau has. Because Esau has the same mindset. You understand? So because he's got the same mindset, he's not going to come direct to Adam. He will use the Adam's woman to go to, to attack Adam indirectly. You understand? So what we're reading here, read it again, verse 5. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. For God does know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Knowing good and evil. So now the serpent is proposing something different. You understand? And he's being painted as something bad. Now watch this. Give me that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. Watch this. Because what we're reading here um, is that you will notice that what the serpent came to, if she didn't come, he didn't come with, with something that was bad on the surface. You understand? The proof of that is here. Second Corinthians 11, verse 13. We're going to read to verse 14. First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. No, no, second Corinthians. Second Corinthians 11, verse 13. Yes, sir. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. Go ahead. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. That's what the white man would do when he took over in the 1400s. Go ahead. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You see that? He says, don't marvel. He says, because Satan himself is transformed into, the, into an angel of light. Meaning what? I'm the bright star of wisdom. So that's what's going on here in Genesis 3. So what is going on? What is, what, what, what is effect? What is the agenda behind what the serpent is doing? Give me Mark 10 now. Mark 10 verse 6. Let's go back there. Mark 10 verse 6. We're going to read down. This is the objective of what the serpent is doing is this. Watch this. Come on, Mark 10, Mark, Mark chapter 10, verse 6. Read. But from the beginning of the creation, God made the male and female. God made the male and female from the beginning of creation. Go ahead. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Read. And they twain shall be one flesh. Uh -huh. So then... They are no more twain, but one flesh. He says, then are they are no more twain, but one flesh. He's repeating it again, because remember, it says from the beginning, they, they begin their church, which is the Adam and Eve, the marriage of Adam and Eve. That was the beginning. That was the first church, by the way, in Genesis. So here it says, they, it says, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then it says, so then they are no there are no more twain, but one flesh. So the objective of the serpent was what? Was to separate Eve from Adam. Because when they were one flesh, that was powerful. You understand? When they, were, when they, were one, when, when they are one flesh, they are powerful. So when the serpent saw the unity of the man, a man and a wife that agreed together, that aggravated him. He said, no, no, no. I need to separate them. You understand? I need to separate them. I need to cut their cords in Sunday. Because that, likewise, that, that's what you're seeing today. The reason why you see it's hard for the black woman to support the black man is what was the, who, who's in the middle? The white man is in the middle of it. And the way he's in the middle of it is what? He's not there directly sitting with you in the middle, physical. Mm -mm. It's a spiritual thing. Pants, you understand? Women's rights, women's movement, you understand? The feminist movement, you understand? E gender equality. Yeah, you, you see that thing? Women can also do the things that men do. Men can do as well. 
So he doesn't really have to be there physically, but spiritually in the black woman's mind, he's sitting right there. He's the driving seat. When are you married to this woman? But she's, she's not married to you. She's married to the white man. She's married to Satan. So what the mindset tells you who she's married to. You understand? So read that verse again. I'm jumping the gun now. Read verse eight. One more again. Mark chapter 10, verse 8. Ray. And they twain shall be one flesh. Uh -huh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. Read on. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. You see that? What you see, what therefore that God has joined together says, let no man put asunder. But the, the Satan's objective was to do what? Was to put asunder the marriage of Adam and Eve. Why? I'm going to show you something right here. Give me the book of Psalms 45, okay? Give me Psalms 45 real quick. I'm going to show you why. Psalms 45, read verse 10. Psalms chapter 45, verse 10. Mm -hmm. Hearken, O daughter, and consider, and incline thine ear, Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. He says, forget also, says, how can all daughter, now let's talk about a sister that is married. He says, how can all daughter and consider and incline thine ear? Forget also thine own people and thy father's house because your father will give your hand in marriage to that man that you're going to be joined together and the two of you will be one flesh. So that's why now your father, your father now, has given the responsibility that he was he had over the, his daughter over to you. Now watch the next verse. Go ahead. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty. The king For that will desire thy, hold on. The king that will desire thy beauty, that's your husband. He's the king. You understand? Go ahead. For he is thy lord. Mm -hmm. And He's thy what? Thou him. He is thy lord. He is thy lord. He is there is your Lord. He is thy Lord. Go ahead. And worship thou him. You see that part right there? And worship thou him. When he says worship thou him, meaning what? You must glorify your Lord. Glorify your husband. You see this thing right there? Meaning what? You must reverence him. You must show him deep respect. That's what we read in right here. The serpent didn't like that thing. When they look at it, they say, no. A marriage is a, is a slave contract. Marriage is a me, I don't want to be oppressed. I don't want a man telling me what to do and so on and so forth. But you give him your most valuable asset, which is between your knees, but you don't want him to tell you what to do. Well, that's crazy. Madness. So the serpent didn't like the what? He didn't like how the Mosai set up marriage. The serpent didn't like that thing. And the serpent picked up something in Eve as well. Because Eve, her doing this, she didn't like that. Because it's not like she didn't know that she was supposed to do this. She knew because she did it until the serpent showed up on the scene. When the serpent showed up on the scene, it was a perfect time because these are things that Eve didn't like. She had the spirit of resistance, but it was subtle. Until the right conditions were activated, and guess what? This, that spirit of resistance came out. You understand? So now watch this. Give me that in um, Wisdom of Solomon chapter 2, verse 23. Wisdom of Solomon 2, verse 23. Because the serpent understood something. You understand? Because there is no cause. You know why? You know why the serpent exploited that weakness? Remember now. Today you notice that you've got women that are competing like women are competing to be men. They want to be more men than the actual role that the God has gave to the men to be a man, if that makes sense. So they look at the role, the gender roles that the Lord has given as a form of competition. You see, because the man is supposed to excel, you understand, progress. The woman is supposed to support this man. So now some women, when they see the man progressing, they become envious of his progress, not realizing that his progress is your progress. 
His excellency is your excellency. He, when he's honored, you get honored as well. But today the black women don't see it like that. She sees it as a competition. You understand? That's why they're always fighting with their men. They are fighting with their law. Why? Because she's always in competition when she don't realize that she's got a role to fulfill. He's got a role to fulfill. But you know, she's competing for the role that the man was given by the Mosai. Hence the confusion in the house. You understand? You read that, Wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 23. Mm -hmm. For God created man to be immortal and made him to be an image of his own eternity. Now I want you to sit down and really think about this, what we're reading. It says, read that part again, verse 23. I want to show you something. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 23. Mm -hmm. For God created man to be immortal. To be what? To be immortal. To be what? To be immortal. It says God created man to be immortal. So we were not created to die. I'm going to show you something. The envy, you understand? Keep reading. You know what? Keep reading. Let's finish that verse. We're going to read the next verse as well. I'm going to show you something. And made him to be an image of his own eternity. Go ahead. Nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world. Wait. And they, and they that do hold of his side do find it. You see what he said, but nevertheless, but he says, however, through envy of the devil came death into the world. I'm going to deal with verse 24 for in a second, but I want to deal with verse 23 in knowledge of verse 24. It says, God created man to be mortal. Eve understood that Adam was going to live forever. And she also understood that she, she will live forever. Because of what? Because of the commandments that the power that was given to Adam is the same power that she got in terms of what? She's, she's, she's now married to a man that is a God on earth. So when he's honored, because when you read Ezekiel, it tells you that he was beautiful to look upon. He was filled with wisdom. You understand? So remember, everything that is on earth, the fowls of the air, you understand, creeping things, the fish and all that, Adam gave them names to all of them. Adam understood the spirit that was on these animals, hence the name he gave unto them. The fruits, the veggies, all the names of the fruit and the veggies, they were given names based on the spirit that is on them. The pomegranate, the apple, the, the, the figs. These names that we're reading about, the, the spices that we read about in the Bible, the names of these spices were given by Adam based on the medicinal purposes that goes along with it and the spirit in that in them. Adam, Adam, listen, Adam was a god. Understand that thing. Now, you can imagine the level of power and glory Adam had, and Eve was respected because of that. Eve didn't like that. Even though she also she was given eternal life. But she hated the Adam's position, Adam's position so much that she was willing to do this. Get Sarah 25, Sarah 25 and verse 24. Watch this. Ecclesiasticus chapter 25, verse 24. Read. Of the woman came the beginning of sin, mm -hmm. and through her we all die. You see that thing? Of the woman came the beginning of sin, and through her we all die. There was no such thing as death during the time of Adam, before, before the serpent entered into the room. There was no such thing as death. So it says, it says, of the woman came the beginning of sin, and through the woman we all die. That means her agenda with the serpent was to stop eternal life. Think about it. That's why today, the black woman is easy for her to commit an abortion. Death is nothing for her. Think about it. Look at the, um, the millions and millions of abortions that are committed every day by the black woman. The, the babies that are thrown in the waters, in the dustbins that are picked up by Pick It Up, by the South African police service and all that. They find, uh, they find babies floating in the oceans, in the waters, alive. Who threw the baby in there? The black woman did it. 
That, read the verse again, verse 24, so we understand it. Ecclesiasticus chapter 25, verse 24. Mm -hmm. Of the woman came the beginning of sin, and through her we all die. You see that? And through her we all die. So immortal life was ended because of the sin of the woman. Mm -hmm. What the woman did. Eternal life was, meaning everything was beautiful. Everything, there was peace. Meaning what? There was prosperity. There was glory. Everything was perfect. She did not like that. She hated the fact that there was no drama. She hated the fact that there was no confusion. So she wanted excitement. She said, you know what? I'm going to create drama here to end this whole thing. And that's exactly what happened. That's why now we're in South Africa calling ourselves Bantus and Negroes. Because of what envy. Now let's go back to Wisdom of Solomon 2, read verse 24 now. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 2, verse 24. Nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world. Stop right there. He says, nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world. So, so Eve, what was the envy? Eve envied the devil. That was her envy. She wanted to be like the serpent. Because remember, the serpent came to Eve with a what? Came to Eve with, quote unquote, knowledge and wisdom. And Eve was convinced that if you learn this type of knowledge right here, because the serpent convinced Eve to say, if you, everything that Adam taught you, he's, he, the reason why he taught you is teaching you that there's certain things you're not supposed to know. So Adam is hiding things from you. Now she's, he's putting doubt in Eve's mind. Adam is hiding things from you. They don't really want you. Adam and God are hiding things from you. They don't really want you to know what's really going on. Because they know that if you eat this, your eyes are going to be open. You are going to be just like them. That's the mindset. You see that thing? Now, watch this. Uh, it says, nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world. Eve envied the devil. What did Eve envy about the devil? The knowledge and the wisdom. The lies. The philosophies. You understand? Watch this. Now, give me, give me Proverbs 3.31. I'm going to show you something. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 31. Read. Envy thou not the oppressor, and mm -hmm. choose none of his ways. Read that again. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 31. Go ahead. Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. So this is a commandment. It says, envy thou not the oppressor, and don't choose any of his ways. Hold this. Give me Acts 10, 38. He says, don't envy the oppressor and choose none of his ways. I'm going to show you something here. Because it's in conjunction with what we read. Remember, it says, through envy of the devil, Eve envied the serpent because of the so-called knowledge that the serpent came with. And the, the added benefit to that was that you're going to be equal or above your husband. But he, he knew, the serpent knew that Eve envy envies him. Not only that, Eve hates the position that Aram is in. She also wants to be glorified just like him on the same level, which is impossible. But the serpent understood that. Okay, now read that. Acts 10, 38. Watch this. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Go ahead. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And all, all that were what? And all that were oppressed of the devil. And all that were oppressed of the devil. All that were oppressed of the devil. So when Christ walked the sea, walked the earth, that was what he was doing. You understand? The apostles that came after him, they also did the same thing. To deliver all those that were oppressed of the devil. So guess what? So when we say, when the Bible says in Proverbs 3.31, it says, Envy thou not the oppressor and choose none of his ways. Because the oppressor is the devil. The devil's job is to oppress. 
So what did the serpent do to Eve's marriage? He oppressed that marriage by dividing Eve from Adam. That's how Adam's, Adam Eve's marriage was oppressed. What was the oppression? Division was the, or the oppression. Isn't the same thing that is happening now? You understand? During the Berlin Conference, when they divided the continent, you understand? They divided us and they separated us. They gave us new names so we hate each other and we don't get along. That's the devil's tactic is that his oppression, his tactic of oppression is what? Division. Hmm. Understand that. The devil's tactic when it comes to oppression, his main objective is to divide you. God says that you two shall be one flesh. The devil said, mm -mm, you two shall be separate flesh. You must be on one mind. He says, no, you must be on separate mind. You must not be on one accord. You must argue back and forth. Why do you think there's reality so-called TV shows of black women just, you know, disrespecting black men on national TV, disky divas and whatnot? Because all of that is an example of how the devil moves. Division, he divides you and he conquers you and he rewards you for the fact that he divided you. Now you think you're better than your husband. You think you're better than the black man. That's how the devil moves. That's how the white man operates back. Division. That's why there was such an uproar where Julius Mal when Julius Malema went to him to visit Msholozi and they were, they were having a Twitter discussion. So, no, let's meet for tea. That created a, a whole uproar on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. They were tweeting all over the place because they were coming together to discuss things that they did not even want to discuss in public. But in news, that demonic channel, they were out, they weren't happy about that. Because that's how the devil moves. You understand? Division. Now go back to Proverbs 331. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 31. Wait. Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. You see that? He says, envy thou not the oppressor and choose none of his ways. One of the ways of the oppressors was is division. And Eve chose the, 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 the he chose, Eve chose the way of the oppressor, which is what? To separate herself from her husband. How? When she was told that you can be equal or above your man. That's the root she took. You see that thing? She took that role. That's how that marriage was oppressed. Now, let's go back to Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3. Let's go back there. Genesis 3 and verse 5. Read that again for me. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. Mm -hmm. For God does know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, this goes into a married couple, right? Now, I'm going to deal with the single sisters now. Because remember, what we dealt with in terms of marriage, in terms of marriage is that the, your marriage is going to be divided. But you can still be together because Adam and Eve were still together, but spiritually they were divided. You see that thing? They were to, together, but spiritually and mentally, they were not on the same plane. So he, the white man does not even have to be there in the midst. But mentally, he's there to divide you. You see, there's division in the house. So guess what? And you're going to, the, the quickest way to see if your wife is of the devil, or she's listening to the devil, or she believes the philosophies that the devil teaches from the time of Genesis, you understand, is what? Resistance. That's the sign. Resistance is the sign that Satan is in the midst. Because according to the law, get that in 7, verse 26. According to the law, this is how things are supposed to be. Okay? Because she understands her role. He understands his role. We watch God. Sirach 7, 26. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 26. Hast thou a wife after thy mind? Forsaken not. 
But give not thyself over to a light woman. A light woman is a woman whose mind is not after your mind. That's a light woman. You know why she's a light woman? Because if there's division in the house, that means that marriage is not going to succeed. You get children, the children also will grow up confused. Why? Because her mind is not after your mind. Guess what? That means that the nation that you, the two of you are going to create, that nation will be divided because the children will grow up being separate, spiritually disconnected from their men. Now the nation is broken. You see that thing? So your mind has to be after your husband's mind. The minute your mind is, does not want to um, follow after your husband's mind, who's following after Christ, that means you are a light woman. And that's how, that's, that tells you that Satan is in the room. You're not alone anymore. It's not just the two of you. No, Satan is present. You understand? Now watch this. Now let's deal with for the single sisters. Watch this. Give me the book of Numbers 12. We're going to start at verse, hmm. let me see where I want to start. Numbers 12, we're going to start at verse 1. You know what? Mm, let me see. Yeah, read verse 1. We're going to read down. Numbers 12 and verse 1, we're going to read down. Watch this. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. Mm -hmm. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. So Moses married an Ethiopian woman, right? Watch this because he was away for 40 years. You understand? Watch this. Next verse. Go ahead. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Has he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now, this is Miriam and Aaron discussing. They are doing a back and forth about what Moses is doing. You know why they are, they are doing this? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. Because the key is, had the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? So has Moses, the Lord told, the Lord is only dealing with Moses. You understand? Had he not spoken, is, has he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. You know what's going on here? Miriam envied, uh, envied Moses' position. She envied. She had the spirit on, of envy on her. You understand? She was disrespectful. That was not her place. You understand? She forgot her role. That was the problem with Miriam at this point. Guess what Miriam was? A feminist. Yeah. Miriam was a feminist. This is the feminist movement. Remember, the feminist movement is started in Genesis 3, verse 1 through 5, with Eve and the serpent. Miriam is continuing the same thought process here. The same spirit that Eve got when she spoke to the serpent is the same spirit that our forefather, our foremother Miriam has here. You understand? Read again verse 2. Numbers chapter 12, verse 2. Mm -hmm. And they said, Had the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Has he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. You see that? So, and the Lord heard what they were discussing. When, so Miriam was saying, he, the Lord also speaks to us also. You understand? He's not only just speaking to Moses. Does he only dealing with you, Moses? You understand? They are, so they are murmuring and complaining about that. You understand? And you know how the black woman is? She just be running a black mouth. No, no breaks, no nothing. Because why? There's no fear. There's no thing, there's no thought process of law the judgment that will come upon. You understand? So sisters, as the single sisters now, we are the prophets of the Lord back on this earth. You understand that? you Because you, I know the sisters don't see us as the prophets of the law. That's why when we give instruction, they do whatever the hell they want. But when judgment comes, they are confused and surprised. Why? Because... When the scriptures go out, the instruction go out, the counsel go out, you just ignore it because you don't see us as the prophets of the Lord back on this earth. You're operating in the, you don't operating with the spirit of fear. Watch this, keep reading. Verse three, come on. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Meaning what? He humbled himself to what this Bible is saying. Go ahead. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses, and unto you see that part right? Hold on. It says the, and the Lord heard it in verse 2. And verse 4, it says, he spoke suddenly unto Moses. Meaning what? 
the Lord was mad. When he said, sorry, he was mad as hell. He said, okay, let me pay them a visit. He spoke suddenly unto Moses, come on. And unto Aaron. Mm. And unto Miriam. Unto Miriam, the black woman, the sister now, go ahead. Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. Now the three of them are coming out. The Lord is saying, okay, let me deal with this thing. Because remember, they were murmuring and complaining in verse two, not thinking that they're not thinking that the Lord is going to deal with this thing. Now, verse four, the most says, okay, let me deal with this thing. I'm going to bring forth judgment now because of this evil. Okay, go ahead. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. Read. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will mm -hmm. speak unto him in a dream. Watch this. Go ahead. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. He says, my, he says the way I'm dealing with Moses is not the same way I'm going to deal with you, Moses. I'm not going to deal. It's not the same way I'm going to deal with you, Aaron, or the same way I'm going to deal with you, Miriam. The way I'm dealing with Moses, I'm not going to deal with you the same way. The Most High will not deal with us the same way on the same level. It's not like that in the scriptures. You understand? So the reason why I'm bringing this out is because when it comes to single sisters, because why? You know what? Let me not jump the gun. Keep reading. Let's keep reading. Watch this. My servant Moses is not so. Uh -huh. Who is faithful in all my house. Who is faithful in all my house. Read on. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore, then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? You see what the question is? Were you not afraid, were you not scared to speak against my servant Moses? Because when you are given counsel from leadership, I'm talking about the single sisters that are not married because I'm a father to you. You understand? I'm your daddy. I'm your father. So now, when you are given instruction, you don't do it. You are, you are not afraid to speak against the dignities that the Lord has set over you to guide you and teach you. So much so that you will do things so diabolical, you don't even see the evils that you are doing until the Lord brings it out. And say, okay, you don't want to listen. I'm going to put you on blast now on this day. Nobody going to stop it. I'm going to put you on blast to shame you. Why? Because you don't listen, you're not afraid to speak against what the prophets that I'm setting up. Okay, go ahead. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. The anger, the anger, the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. When you speak against the leadership, you go against the instruction that your fathers are giving you, Guess what? The anger of the Lord will be kindled against you. Because guess what? When you questioning the man of the Most High, you speaking evil, you do whatever the hell you want, guess what? You are disrespecting the man that the Lord has set up. Because what are you doing? You think you, you can be on the same level as the man that the Lord has set up. You think you're on the same level. You think you are equal to them. So you need to be humbled by the most like God. Keep reading. Watch this. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. That's the judgment. It says Miriam became leprous, white as snow. Because the reason why Miriam was the one that was judged like that was because that was not her place to speak against that. To speak about that was not, Aaron was fine but not, not Miriam. She, that was not her place. That was not her role. She was out of order. You understand? So that's why the Lord had to humble her by what? By putting, by bringing leprosy upon her to make her unclean. Go ahead. And Aaron looked upon Miriam and behold, she was leprous. And you see that? She's like, damn. Because the most high God's anger was kindled against Miriam. Because she was running a black mouth. 
She was busy on social media talking to a boy. The Lord said, no problem. I'm going to put you on, I'm going to expose you for your evil. So you can be humbled. Because you've never been humbled as a child when you're growing up. Now you're in your adult age, you're doing evil. You don't want to listen to leadership. You are advising you all the classes that are coming up. You don't learn nothing. One year after the other. You just sit in there. You don't want to learn nothing. And then when you do evil, you don't even thinking about the fact that the angel of the Lord is standing right there by you, recording everything you're doing. Then the day when judgment comes, it's like you're confused. They hate you. They don't like you. Something wrong. No, mm -mm. no because why? You didn't think about it when you were doing it. Now when it's judgment time, you are surprised and, and confused. You understand? That's the mindset of a feminist of a feminist. Guess what? Merit and unmerit is the same mindset. Feminism. Feminism is of the devil. It's the reason why the black community is destroyed. Because it started during the time of Adam. It continued on. Even in the wilderness, all the miracles that Moses performed, Miriam was still running a big black mouth. They saw parting of the Red Sea. She still had the nerve to run a black mouth. You can't make it up. Keep reading. Numbers chapter 12, verse 11. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Because now, now Aaron is changing his tone. He says, he's even saying, my Lord. He's begging Moses now for what just went down. Go ahead. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. Because she was leprous now, white as snow. Read on. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. Now Moses is speaking. He said, okay, I'm going to pray to the Lord to get yourself healed. But watch what happened. Listen what the Lord is saying right here. This is some of you sisters, because you still have that millennium mindset. Married and unmarried, you still a millennial. Because this millennial is this is the ungrateful generation. The ungrateful and lazy and sneaky and deceitful generation. That's them. That's generation Y, generation uh, and me, generation you can't tell me nothing. That's them. Watch what the Lord says about that behavior. Verse 14. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? You see what the question is? The Lord is saying to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Because when you were leprous, for those seven days, Miriam was what? She had leprosy on her, on her skin. She was a white woman. So now what's happening here says, if her father had but spit in her face, if her father corrected her when she was young, she was not going to speak against the man. She was not going to open a black mouth and run a mouth against the men of Israel, the leaders that the Lord is setting up. She wasn't going to do that. But because her father didn't do that, that's why she's doing it. Such is some of you, the sisters. You come into, you come in Israel, you were just doing evil in your father's house. Married and unmarried, you were doing evil in your father's house. Your father didn't check you. She did not correct you. She did not put, she did not put, she did not put you in check. You understand? She did not beat that bum. She did not smack you. Not across the face, the bum, according to the scripture. He didn't do that. So now, because that didn't happen, you grow up, you are bold towards correction. You are bold towards counsel. You are bold towards the scriptures that are coming out and counsel. Now we say, okay, we've done our part. Lord, you do your part. Then the most I say, okay, I'm going to deal with you. And that's what happened to Miriam. So that's why we get on you sisters so much. Why? Because there's so much freedom that has been given to you when you were growing up. There was not, a, there was not chores given to you when you were growing up. You grew up, you did evil. You talked you talk to boys, you had sex. You were jollering and all of that. You were playing the whore in your father's house. Now you come in Israel. Now we're giving you law and order. Even with the information you now have, you're still playing the whore in the father, in your father's house, in Israel. You cannot make this stuff up. Why? Because they don't believe the Bible. They don't believe it until 
judgment comes. Then you want us to pray for you. Then you want us to fast, to ask the Lord to have mercy upon you because of what? Because of the judgment that has come upon. The Lord will still judge you. He will forgive you, but he will still bring forth judgment. That's what you don't understand. The Most High will still bring forth that judgment. Okay? Keep reading. Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that, let her be received in again. You see that thing? That's what I told you, sisters. If I hear anything else, that now you're dealing with the boys, at you, I'm gonna, we're going to put your ass out. Excuse my French, but you will be put out of the congregation. Why? Because we're trying to build, we're building a nation here. You understand? So this part right here, Miriam was a feminist at this point, and the Lord had to check her because she was a feminist. The Lord had to check her behind. You understand? Now watch this. I'm going to show you something because we read two parts. The feminist movement in terms of single sisters that we're reading here with Miriam. Then we're dealing with the married woman that what we read in our foremother Eve. You understand? When she gave place to the devil. You understand? Now watch this. I'm going to show you something. Because go back to Proverbs 331. Remember, there is all of this is happening is because of the Eve's envy towards the serpent. And the, the fruits of the lies that the serpent came with in order to deceive into thinking she can be equal or above. That's the feminist movement as well for married women. So the feminist movement was didn't just hit the married women. It also hit the unmarried sisters. You understand? Watch this. Hmm. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 31. Go ahead. Watch the read. Proverbs. I'm going to show you something. Read it. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 31. Come on. Envy thou not the oppressor and choose none of his ways. He says, Don't envy your oppressor and don't choose any of the ways of the oppressor. One of the ways of the oppressor is what? Feminism. You understand? And guess what? The oppressor does not push feminism in his house. The oppressor pushes feminism in the nation of Israel. And who's the oppressor using? The white man, the devil. Who's he using? He's using the black woman. He's using the black woman. That's why you see, look at Buboiti. Look at Bu, um, Bu, Bu Kelukuman. Look at Bu, um, who's this? Kanyimbao. Look at all our sisters in the world, you understand? The celebrities and all and all that. Look at the stuff that they are doing. The envy of the oppressor. You understand? Now, I'm going to deal with that feminism stuff. Watch this. I'm going to show you something here. So we understand what this feminism is all about. Because I'm going to show you, because when you read the history of feminism, there's different waves of it. There's different waves of feminism. And I'm going to take you through all of them. Watch this. Okay. We're going to start with the first wave of feminism. Okay. Now I want you to read that. Okay. The humanist.com. The humanist.com. Mm -hmm. A brief look at the four waves of feminism. So we're going to go over the four waves of feminism. Okay, let me see if I cannot uh, minimize this thing. Yeah, okay. Read that. Read that again. A brief look at the four waves of feminism reading from thehumanist.com. Okay, now let's read that. Okay, read. The modern day humanist movement has embraced feminism, but like various types of humanism, the tension between the various waves of feminism is ever present. Okay, come on. Established feminist movements within the United States have primarily fallen into four different time periods. Mm -hmm. Read. The deep the different movements often term first wave, second wave, third wave, and fourth wave feminism share similar goals but different characteristics of action. So these four waves of, fe of feminism, they share different goals, but 
The fourth wave of feminism, that's the main agenda. You understand? But give me that in Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2, when he, when he did, where, where, where um, Christ was explaining to John the depths of Satan. Okay? Read that in Revelation 2, 24. Read that. Revelation chapter 2, verse 24. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. You see what he's saying? He says, he says, and have not known the depths of Satan. He says, because you have not known the depths of Satan, I'm not going to put you un unto you any other burden, because I need you to focus on understanding the depths of Satan. Meaning what? How he moves. Okay, Ray. But Go that which the article. He... Yes, sir. These various waves of feminism are interwoven into women's rights, civil rights, and social justice movements. Go ahead. Women's rights. Okay. So the feminism, the feminist movement is involved, is interwoven with women's rights, civil rights, because the civil rights have nothing to do with the white woman, have everything to do with the black woman, what happened in the 60s in the US, what happened here, what happened in the, 60s, the 50s and the 60s and the 70s here in South Africa, we're experiencing similar issues, okay? You understand? Wanting to be, um, wanting to be treated like human beings and so forth. Go ahead. What has especially characterized these movements is the championing of equality under the law and within our social economic structures. You see that thing? It says championing the equality under the law. That goes into gender equality. There's no such thing as gender equality when it comes to the Heavenly Father, the Most High God. There's no such thing. Go ahead. That said, the differences and the existing tension among these various waves outlines an important question. What kind of equality does feminism seek? So they are asking the question now, what kind of equality does the feminist movement seek? What are they really looking for? Go ahead. The ways of feminism are not a linear progression and consensus of progress, even though they roughly follow a linear timeline. Instead, they are intense there are intense changes of perspective among different generations of women. So now they are, they're gonna affect different generations of women, meaning what? The first wave, they will implement certain things. Then the next wave, they will add more things. The third wave, they'll add even more things. The fourth wave, guess what? They go to the extreme. So those are the depths of Satan, like we read in Revelation 2.24. Okay, go ahead. First wave feminism during the late 19th century is that's primarily the, the late 19th century, that's the 1800s. Go ahead, the late 1800s, right? During the late 19th century is primarily characterized by the women's suffrage movement and they are championing of the women's right to vote. So now read that part again. First wave feminism during the late 19th century is primarily characterized by women's suffrage movement and they are championing of the women's right to vote. So now it says the first wave was focusing on the women's suffrage movement and they are championing of women's rights to vote. So women's suffrage movement and voting. Okay, watch this. Now read that, women's suffrage on Wikipedia. Let's see what is the women's suffrage movement. Women's suffrage, reading from Wikipedia. Women's suffrage is the right of women to vote in elections. Come Beginning on. in the mid 19th century, aside from the work being done by women for broad-based economic and political equality and for social reforms, women sought to change voting laws to allow them to vote. But let's see the agenda, keep reading. National and international organizations formed to coordinate efforts toward that objective, especially the International Women's Suffrage Alliance, 
founded in 1904 in Berlin, Germany, mm. as well as for equal civil rights for women. You see that thing? So this, the, the feminist movement was a white woman's movement. That's what he's saying. He says, women sought to change voting laws to allow them to vote. National and international organizations formed to coordinate efforts towards that objective, especially the International Women Suffrage Alliance founded in 1904. Because in 1904, where was the black man and the black woman? In slavery, being oppressed. So obviously, this is not talking about the black woman. The black woman is not in the list yet. This is a white woman's problem against her, her white man. That's, this is a white woman's problem. The black woman has nothing to do with this. You understand? But you see that last part, it says, as well as for equal civil rights for women. So they are preparing for what? They are preparing to introduce the black woman into the, the, the waves of feminism. But that, that would happen 45 years later because that took place now in the what? The 60s and so forth. Mm -hmm. Watch this. Now, that part right there, now we, we've established that the women's suffrage movement was about white women who wanted to be equal to their white men because the white man was in power. So they wanted to be equal to their, their white men. But guess what? The question you have to ask yourself, who gave the okay for women to vote, for these white women to vote? Who did that? A white man. A man did that. A man allowed that to happen. You see that? And once they did it, the white woman wasn't separated from her white man. They're still together. Understand, this is the wave one. Now let's go back. Let's go back, read the second wave now. You know, read the first wave again. We must read that thing again. Reading from the humanist.com. Come on. First wave feminism during the late 19th century is primarily characterized by the women's suffrage movement and they are championing of the women's right to vote. Uh -huh. While many, while many, con excuse me, sir. While many, while, continue, many? while many continue to celebrate feminist leaders like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cardi Stanton, the women's suffrage movement largely excluded and discriminated against women of color, including suffragettes such as Ida B. Wells, Ellen Watkins Harper, and Sojourner Truth. So now these women, these are black women. So the first wave did not include the black woman. The first wave, the black woman was not involved here because both the black man and the black woman was on one accord. The black woman was still wearing was was still wearing dresses. You understand? We still got married. They still got married and so forth. We took care of our families and all that. The black man and the black woman was in one on one accord at this point during the time of the first wave of the feminist movement. That was on one accord. Now Susan B. Anthony, which was a white woman, Elizabeth Stanton, white woman, they realized that listen. In the second wave, we need to, because remember the depths of Satan. They started with them to make it seem or the second wave. No, but it started with us. So you, you understand, we're not discriminating and so forth. You see, now they are talking about discrimination. That's what we're reading here, okay? Now watch this, read that. White women, I'm going to show you that this, this feminist movement, that's a white woman's problem. Read it. White women were eventually guaranteed the right to vote in 1920 under the 19th Amendment. You see that? So the first wave of feminism, the feminist movement was a white woman's problem. The black woman had no business getting herself involved in this. You understand? No business whatsoever. Because even when we were oppressed, we still got married. We, our family was still intact. Give me that in Sarah 25 and 1 real quick. We still got married, you understand? You know what, before you get, get me Hebrews 13 because that one is the right scripture for marriage being honorable. 
Yeah, we still honored marriage. Okay, Hebrews 13 verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. Where? Marriage is honorable in all, and mm -hmm. the bed undefiled. Come on. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. We did not play whoremongers. There, were, there was no whoremongers during that time. We honored marriage. And because we honored marriage, guess what? This is, the, this is, this is what aggravated our slave masters. Like, he, like, they, were, like they, they were aggravated during the time of Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve honored marriage, they were married. And when they were married, this is the, one of the main things that aggravated the devil. Read that in Zerah 25 and 1. This is the key ingredient right here. Okay, watch this. Ecclesiastes chapter 25 verse 1. Mm -hmm. In three things I was beautified and stood up beautiful both before God and man. Mm -hmm. The unity of brethren, the love of neighbors, and man and a wife that agree together. You see that? There is, there is the, our forefathers, they honored marriage from the time of Adam and Eve up to during the 60s, out of the 50s, the, we honored marriage. And because we honored marriage, the black man and the black woman was on one accord. Men and a wife that agreed together. They understood the, the problems. They understood who the enemy was. They knew who the enemy was. There was no confusion. And so the feminist movement, they realized that, listen, yes, we got the right to vote. But these people that we are oppressing, they are still on one accord. They are still getting married, even though we are oppressing them. They still get along, even though we are oppressing them. So we need to find a way to separate them. You understand? So let's go back to the, to the article now. When it says, um, because you know what? Start, started that part when it says, while many continue to celebrate feminist leaders, while many continue to celebrate feminist leaders like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Stop the right woman there. suffrage. So Eliza, uh, Susan B. Anthony was a white woman. Elizabeth Stanton, white woman. So these were not leaders. Because who, who, who actually, who, uh, who agreed to allow them to vote? A white man did it. A man allowed them to do it. So they were not the leaders. The white man was still the leader of this feminist movement, although he used white women to do it. You understand? He used his white women to do it, but he's the one that made the final call of, okay, we're going to allow you to vote now. You understand? Read on. The women's suffrage movement largely excluded and discriminated against women of color, including suffrages such as Ida B. Wells, so Ellen Wetkins, these are black, Ida B. Well, that's a black woman. Go ahead. Ellen went Watkins Harper and Ellen Sojourner Truth. A, Ellen Watkins Harper. Ellen Watkins Harper and Sojourner Truth. These three black women, they are the ones that was now what? Because when you read about them, they were extremely exalted. You understand? They were the ones that were pushing feminism in the black community. That's why today, you still see black women all over the earth. They are pushing this. They call it black feminism. You understand? They have no business getting themselves involved in this stuff. But because envy of the devil, that's why they are doing it. Right? White women were eventually guaranteed the right to vote in 1920 under the 19th Amendment. Go ahead. Women of color wouldn't have the universal right to vote until 45 years later with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, mm -hmm. when all people of color were guaranteed the right to vote. You see that thing? It says they were not, we, we were not allowed to vote until this time. And we were not allowed to vote in South Africa until 1994. Think about that. Hmm. Let's look at the second wave of feminism. Second wave feminism from mm -hmm. roughly the 1960s to the 1990s encompassed far more issues such as pay equality, reproductive rights, female sexuality, and domestic violence. 
stop right there. So you see the second wave of feminism, it focuses on these things now. It says it encompassed far more issues such as pay equality, meaning what? Men and women must be paid equal, reproductive rights, female sexuality and domestic violence. I wanna focus on those. Reproductive rights, female sexuality. Hmm, you might be wondering, why am I going over this? Watch this. Now, let's go to this article right here, okay? Um, so where are you reading from? Do you see that? Four waves of feminism? Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Reading from Pacific, Pacific University, Oregon. Your Pacific University, Oregon. Okay, so read that. Pacific University, Oregon. Four waves of feminism. Four waves of feminism. Now we're gonna jump down. I wanna scroll down a little bit. Mm. Where is that part? Yes, this part right here. I want you to read this part. Yes, read this one. Read that, yes, the second sir. wave. The second wave began in the 1960s and continued into the 90s. This wave unfolded in the context of the anti-war and civil rights movement and the growing self-consciousness of a variety of minority groups around the world. The minority groups is talk about us because they say we're a minority, but we outnumber the sand of the sea. So that's just a, it's a social, it, it, uh, it's, 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 it's um, psychological warfare. When they say we're a minority, it's, it's called psychological warfare because in Hosea 1 verse 10, it tells you that we cannot be measured, no number. So that's just ESO psychological warfare. Now, um, it says this wave, read that part again. It says this wave unfolded. This wave unfolded in the context of the anti-war and civil rights movements and the growing self-consciousness of a variety of minority groups around the world. So now you see that part right there when it says um, unfolded in the context of the anti-war, that goes into what? That goes into, this goes into World War II. And civil rights, that the civil rights movements where our forefathers in the US and our forefathers over here during the 60s, they were looking for civil rights because we are being oppressed by the apartheid government and we're still being oppressed by it. Go ahead. The new left was on the rise and the voice of the second wave was increasingly radical. Come in on. this phase, sexuality, and reproductive rights were dominant issues. Stop and right much there. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. Read that part again. It says, in this phase, meaning the second wave of feminism, what was pushed the most? Read that part again. In this phase, sexuality and reproductive rights were dominant issues. Sexuality and reproductive rights were dominant issues in the second wave of feminism. Keep that in mind. Read on. And much of the movement's energy was focused on passing the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution, guaranteeing social equality regardless of sex. You see that thing, social equality regardless of sex. Keep reading. Watch this. This phase began with protests against the Miss America pageant in Atlantic City in 1968 and 1969. Read on. Feminist, feminist parody parodied what they held to be a degrading cattle parade that reduced women to objects of beauty dominated by a patriarchy that sought to keep them in the home or in dull, low, low paying jobs. Now stop right there. You see that thing is as feminists parodied what they held to be degrading cattle parade that reduced women to objects of beauty dominated by patriarchy that sought to keep them in, in the home, meaning what? A woman being in the, meaning taking care of your household. Hold on, give me that in Sarah 26. You see, the feminist movement is a white woman's problem. You understand? Now in the 60s, they are bringing the black women into this movement. 
because the the white woman wanted to work in industrial um in 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 in, in this in this uh in these industrial warehouses you understand to work male jobs and so forth that's when now the wearing of pants started to become what to become a thing because they were complaining that no when we are wearing skirts and dresses they are being caught by these machines that we work we work on in the factories but you have no business working there that's not the job you know lifting stuff up that's not your job so they wanted to be equal to their men even on that level started with voting now it goes into what working the same jobs and getting paid the same jobs and they realize or they are not their movement is not that big because they themselves they are the minority we are the majority so they brought the black women in you see that to take advantage of the civil rights movement watch this get sir 26 okay sir 26 verse 16 Ecclesiastes chapter 26, verse 16. Go ahead. As the sun, when it arises in the high heaven, so is the beauty of a good wife in the ordering of her house. You see that? It says the beauty of a good wife is how she orders her house. So what we're reading here, it says there, there it says what women are used as objects of beauty dominated by patriarchy. How did they come into the world? Because they say patriarchy is a, is they, they make it seem like patriarchy is a bad thing. No, patriarchy is fatherhood. Patriarchy is the society that is run by men, which is how the world is created. Because God is a man. Get that in Exodus 15 verse 3. God is a man. You understand? God is not a woman. This is a man's world. Okay? It is what it is. It's a man's world. The sisters be talking about, no, I want to be independent. But guess what? You are still dependent on the systems and the world that was built by men. But you say you want to be independent. Exodus 15 verse, verse 3. Read it. Exodus chapter 15 verse 3. Go ahead. The Lord is the man of war. The Lord is his name. You see that? The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is a man of war. You understand? Because the feminist movement is anti-patriarchy. They anti-men. They hate men. That's the, the, that's the problem with the feminist movement. They hate men. But the reason why they were born, you see, the feminist movement is the same as the LGBT community. Because the LGBT community, they hate men and women relationships. You understand? They hate that. But Bona, they cannot explain how they came into the world. So it's the same thing. I'm going to show you how slick these waves are. These waves of feminism, they are very slick because they, are, they say they are anti-patriarchy. You're going to see the fourth wave of feminism. I'm going to show you what it is. You understand? Let's keep reading. He says what? He says in the, on the article, he says, dominated by, by patriarchy, that's sought to keep them in the home. Yeah, take care of the kids. Luca goes... Looking after the kids and raising them up, that's a very important job because you dict dictate how the nation is going to look like. So, Bona, that was not enough. You understand? Keep reading. The radical New York group called the Red Stockings staged a counter pageant in which they crowned a sheep as Miss America and mm. threw oppressive feminine artifacts such as bras, girdles, high heels, makeup, and false eyelashes into the trash can. You see that thing? Meaning you want to be like men. We want to look like men now. You understand that? So now, I just wanted to expound on the second wave. But I want to go back now, because I said there's something I want you brothers and sisters to keep in mind. The focus of the second wave of feminism. So go back to the second wave right here. Let's go back to this paragraph. This paragraph right here. The second wave, it focused on two main important things. You understand? Read that. The second wave began in the 1960s and continued into the 90s. Go ahead. This wave unfolded in the context of the anti-war and civil rights movements and the growing self-consciousness of a variety of minority groups around the world. The minority groups making reference to us, but we are not a minority. We don't. The new left was on the rise, and the, and the voice of the second wave 
was increasingly radical. Mm -hmm. In this phase, sexuality and reproductive rights were dominant issues. Stop right there. So sexuality and reproductive rights were dominant issues in the second wave of feminism. Now, let's go to the, this article now. Now read this article. Okay, read that article right there. This is amnesty.org. Okay, read that. Reading from amnesty.org. Sexual and reproductive rights. You see the way that the, the, the way that this white man is demonic. You see what they are showing. They have to pay. They have to show this picture to say, you know, this thing. They are letting you know that they want to go to even to the rural areas to push this feminist garbage because they know that in the rural areas that structure is still there. The man knows his role. The woman knows her role. They want to end that now. Okay, watch this. Now read the overview now. This is, this part right here is the second wave of feminism. Read that. Overview. Whoever you are, wherever you live, all the mm. decisions you make about your own body should be yours. You see that thing? Whoever you are and wherever you live, rural or in the suburbs, your body belongs to you. That's what they are saying, and you have a right. That's what they are saying. That's the mindset of the, these feminist, you know, these feminist women. The black woman has joined that thing. You understand? And she's doing worse than the heathen. Let's get that in Jeremiah. I think it's in Jeremiah. Let me see. I believe it's Jeremiah 5. You understand? Let's get the book of Jeremiah real quick. Because the most high, he wonders about this thing. Okay. Second Chronicles, chapter 33, verse 9. Mm -hmm. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and what? to do worse than the heathen. What did he do? And to do worse than the heathen. And to do worse than the heathen. So whenever we get involved in evil, the nations know that if they bring us to help them, you understand, in their evil, we're going to do worse than them. And that's what they want. That's exactly what they, and that's how this, this, that's how this second wave of feminism was so popular because the black woman got involved and the effeminate black man got involved as well. And it, it became this big blow up. You understand? It became a huge movement because we joined. Read it again. Second Chronicles chapter 33, verse 9. Mm -hmm. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err, yes. and to do worse than the heathen, yes. whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. You see that thing? It says, we did worse than the heathen. Okay, now read the overview again. Reading from amnesty.org. The overview. Whoever you are, wherever you live, all the decisions you make about your own body should be yours. Mm. Go ahead. Yet all over the world, many of us are persecuted for making our own choices, and many more are prevented from making any choices at all. Mm. Governments are trying to dictate who we can kiss, who we should love how we must dress, how we identify ourselves when we have children, when we have children, and how many we have. I want you to read that paragraph again. Yet all over the world, many of us are persecuted for making our own choices, and many more are prevented from making any choices at all. Governments are trying to dictate who we can kiss, mm. who we should love, how we must dress, how we identify ourselves, when we have children, and how many we have. The government doesn't dictate that. They are the ones that are the, the, the feminist movement. I get this is their demands. They say what? They say sexuality and reproductive rights. That's what they, that's what they want. Because guess what? We, 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 we still believe, we believe in what the Bible says male and female marriages. You understand that? 
And when you get married, you have as many children as you want. So Bona, they don't want that. That's why they say they want to have reproductive and sexual rights. That includes when you get married, you have the right to say, I don't want no kids. And if I do, this is how many I want. And your husband says, me, I want as many kids as I want. You say, mm -mm, me, I only want two. That's the feminist movement. That's the second wave right there. Keep reading. Sexual and reproductive rights mean you should be able to make your own decisions about your, about your body. And you see that thing is a sexual and reproductive rights mean you should be able to make your own decisions about your body. You make your own decision about your body. But guess what? I'm going to show you what, what, where this is going. Keep reading. Get accurate information about these issues. Uh -huh. Access sexual and reproductive health services, including contraception. Stop right there. So they're saying sexual and reproductive rights. They include what? Access sexual and reproductive health services, including contraception, meaning what? They are, they are what? They don't, they are anti-patriarchy. So the feminist movement is against men. The feminist movement is against me. That's why it says including contraception. Meaning what? I, if I don't want to get pregnant, I don't want to. I can just go and get an injection. I can get a contraceptive so that when, we, when, we, when you deal with your husband, you don't fall pregnant. Because when you don't, you're not ready for kids. That's the feminist movement. That's the feminist mindset. Understand that. Keep going. Choose if, when, and who to marry. You see that thing? Read on. Decide if you want to have children and how many. Read that again. Read that again. Decide if you want, want to have children and how many. That part right there. It says, do you decide if you want to have children and how many? Hold on a second. Give me the book of Psalms 127. Hmm. Psalms 127. You sisters that are planning to get married, you better make sure that you want kids. You brothers that are going to get married, you better make sure that when you prove a sister, make sure that she wants kids. You understand? You better be on the same playing field because if you are not, guess what? That sister's not ready to be married. That sister don't want to be married. She wants a wedding, but she don't want to be married. Understand that? Watch this. Hmm. Psalms 127. Let me see what verse I want. Psalms 127, real quick. Not in my notes, but Psalms 127, read verse 3. Psalm chapter 127, verse 3. Go ahead. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. You see that thing? It says, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Now read verse 5. Watch this. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. Stop right there. It says, happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. So winning what? You are happy when you have as many children as you want. That's what the Bible is saying right there. The feminist movement is against that. The feminist movement is against the guy, is against the brother that wants as many children as possible. The feminist mindset will say, me, I'm not ready. Or this is how many children I want. And I'm going to decide when I want to have kids. It's not up to you. It's up to me because this is my body. You understand? Because we've got rights. You know, in South Africa, it's a new South Africa. We got rights. Yeah. And when you have sex with your wife and she don't want, and you force it, guess what? She can call the police and say, you raped me. And they will lock you, they will lock you up. I'm showing you how evil this system is. Because why? Because of envy of the devil came death into the world. That's some heavy stuff right there. Read verse 5 again. Psalm chapter 127, verse 5. Right. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. Mm -hmm. They shall not be ashamed 
but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. You see that thing? So that you, we are not going to be ashamed. We're not supposed to be ashamed having as many kids as possible. You understand? It says, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate because we're going to go to the streets and raise up more leaders. So when you have as many children as you can and possibly must, guess what? That's a gift of the most high. But the feminist movement says, no, me, I'll decide when we do and I'll decide how many we have. And if I don't want no kids right now, I can just get a contraception because that will be the way out. Not having kids is, is, is something that was a shame in Israel. Today, having kids is a shame. Oh, you've got kids. Mm, they look at you funny. How many you got? No, I've got six. Whoa, six. Mm, that's too many kids. Shut the hell up. Read that verse again because, you know, a lot of the times we, the mindset, the mind is corrupted by evil communication of the white man and his oppressive system. Read verse 5 again, Psalms 127. Psalm chapter 127, verse 5. Mm -hmm. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. You see that? Happy. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of children. Mm. You should be happy about that thing. So I'm going to say this. You sisters that are married, you better get your mind right. You sisters that are unmarried, you better get your mind right. You must decide. You better make sure that when you, you brothers, when you deal with the sisters, make sure that the sister want kids. Make sure that the sister, not only does she want kids, but she does not have a number of how many she wants to have because it's not up to her. It's up to the husband. You understand? And she should be, she should be happy to give him as many kids as, she, as he wants. There must not be such as, here's another thing, by the way. Because when you do a C-section, right, you can only have two or three at the most because that's how they do it. So you brothers, when they say you get married, your wife falls pregnant, make sure that there's no C-section going on. And don't let the doctor force you or coerce you into having a C-section because they're going to scare you. Oh, no, the baby's not sitting right. Oh, no, the baby's this. Listen, Negro, if there's a pain, put an, why don't you give an epidural when so that the, the pain can subside? But the baby's going to come out. And guess what? The sisters will opt for the, for the C-section. They will. They will opt for the C-section because they know you can only have two at the, two or three at the most. Three will just be pushing it. Because once you have this, after the second one, you know what they do at the, at, the, at the hospital? They close your tubes because they say the third one is going to be a high-risk pregnancy. I'm just telling you right now that you don't fall for the okie dog. Don't fall for that. You understand? Don't fall for that thing. Now watch this. I'm going to stay. I'm going to spend some time here. Okay? Give me the book of First Samuel because having children is always a glorious thing. But today, because of the feminist move, the second wave of the feminist movement, now is the evil thing now. You understand? Now, women that are married, they, 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 they indirectly telling you, this is my body. I decide what I want. Oh, yeah. Give me First Samuel 2. Give me, so, no, First Samuel 1. First Samuel 1 verse 2. Now, this is our, our forefather, Elkanah. He had two wives, Penina and Hannah. Hannah was unable to give birth because she was barren. Penina had children. Now watch this. First Samuel 1 verse 2. Read that. First Samuel chapter 1 verse 2. Go ahead. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah and mm -hmm. the name of the other, Penina. Go ahead. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. But Hannah had no children, right? So she was barren. Now watch this. Keep reading. And this man went up out no, of no. his city. You know what? No, no. That's fine. Jump down to verse 5. Let's just get to the point. Verse 2 was to each. I just wanted to show you that Elkanah had two wives. You understand? Hannah and Penina. Read verse 5 now. And Hannah had no children. Wait. 
First Samuel chapter 1, verse 5. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. Who, who shut up her womb? The Lord had shut up her womb. The Lord shut up our foremother's womb. That meaning she could not conceive. The Lord is the one that does that. You'll never read anywhere in the Bible where men could not produce kids. It's always the woman who the Lord will shut her womb. You understand? Read. And her adversary also provoked her soul her for to adversary. make her. Her adversary, her adversary also provoked her soul. Who was her adversary? Penina. Penina, Elkanah's wife. Penina was the adversary. Go ahead. And her adversary also provoked her soul for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. So now she was mocking it. You understand? She was mocking it and you, she was mocking it and disrespecting it and so forth because she could not conceive because the Lord had shut her womb. You understand? So now she became a reproach. So because you sisters don't understand, it was a shame back then for women not to conceive, not to give birth. But today is something that is celebrated because now you still want to live your life. You still want to act like you are 14 and 16 year old. Hmm? But you want to get married. No, you don't want to get married. You want a wedding, not marriage. So I want you sisters to make sure that that's what, because you say, no, I want a Lord, but the brother don't know when you don't want kids. The brother don't know when you want to decide how many you want and when you want to have kids. That's some evil stuff. Okay? Look at, our, look at what's happening to our foremothers here. You understand? Read. Go ahead. And as he did so, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Because why? Because she was provoking her over and over, making her feel bad that she could not have kids. You understand? But the black woman today, if she does not have kids, guess what? In her mind, she thinks she'll be able to live with that. Until the most I say, okay, I'm going to show you, you really going to want kids. Now, when you really want kids, the Lord said, no, close her womb up now. Close that womb. She's not going to have no kids. Now, when she wants them, the Lord said, no, 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 no. The angel of the Lord will just close the womb. It doesn't matter how many times you want to try, you'll be frustrated. You're going to have to return back to the Lord and ask for mess. And the Lord can close your womb for years, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. You don't conceive nothing. But some of you sisters, you, your mind is not right. Okay. But this is the medicine right here. Watch this. Give me that in Luke chapter 1. Luke 1 verse 7. This is our former Elizabeth. Okay. Luke chapter 1 verse 7. Go ahead. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was buried mm -hmm. and they both were well stricken in years. You see that thing? Elizabeth and our forefather Zacharias, they had no kids. She was buried. You understand? And they were stricken in age. That means from the time they got married and they were, they, they went well beyond 50 years and so forth and all that, guess what? They still did not know, they didn't have no kids. Well stricken in age, that means they was old. You understand? Now read verse 18. Come on. Luke chapter 1 verse 18. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. He's still repeating himself again. He said, listen, he's talking to the angel. Okay, he said, listen, my wife and I, I mean, we old. You understand? I'm an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. You understand? How am I going to have kids? Read verse 24 now. Luke chapter 1, verse 24. Mm-hmm. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, You see that? She, manu, she conceived because the angel told Zechariah, Listen, you're going to have a child. You understand? So now she finally, now she conceived. She, said, she hid herself for five months. 
because she just wanted to make sure that she don't tell nobody because she's been trying, nothing has been going on. Now she's like, mm -mm, I'm gonna hide myself. I wanna make sure that I'm really, you know, I'm developing well and all that. I don't want nobody to be speaking against my pregnancy and whatnot. Go ahead. Thus had the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take mm -hmm. away my reproach among men. To do what? To take away my reproach among men. To take away my reproach among men. My reproach among men. Because when men look at you, they're going to say, mm, something wrong with that sister. How come she's not giving birth? How come she's not falling pregnant? What has she been doing before she got married? Because these are the things that are going to be you now spoken about against you. You understand? Because why? You've got a feminist mindset. Feminism is of the devil. Because look at our foremothers here. They appreciated that thing or listen, you know what? I'm pregnant now. Now watch this. Get that in Genesis 16. Okay. Genesis chapter 16. We're going to read verse 2. Watch this. Hmm. Genesis chapter 16 verse 2. Read. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. Mm. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram that? hearkened. So hold on, hold on, wait, 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 wait. Remember what, read, listen to what we just read. Read that verse again. Watch this. Genesis chapter 16, verse 2. Go ahead. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing. Mm -hmm. I pray. The Lord had done what? The Lord has restrained me from bearing. The Lord has restrained me from bearing. Meaning the Lord has restrained, meaning the Lord has shut up my womb. I cannot conceive. You see that thing? Read on. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. So then now I'm, I'm bringing this up because even our foremother Sarah, she could not conceive. She was barren and she was well stricken in age. You understand? And she could not conceive because that was not something that she wanted. She wanted to have kids. You understand? Because when you look at our foremothers, that the, the, the Lord shut up their womb and so forth, guess what? When the Lord did finally open their womb and they conceived, it was a joyous thing. Watch this. Give me that in Genesis 20. Genesis 21. Okay, Genesis chapter 21 and verse... Read verse 1. Genesis chapter 21, verse 1. Mm-hmm. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Wait. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age. Mm. At the set time of which God had spoken to him. Come on. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. Go ahead. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. Really? And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. So our forefather Abraham was a hundred years old when what? When he begat Isaac. Because when he begat Ishmael, he was 86 years old. But when he began Isaac, he was a hundred years old. You understand? Go ahead. And Sarah said, God has made me to laugh. God has done so what? God has made me to laugh. You see that thing? That was Isaac mean, made to laugh. The name of our forefather Isaac's name means made to laugh. So what we're reading is, is, is as God has made me to laugh. Joy. You see that thing? Because it was a beautiful thing to have kids. When you don't have kids, that's not a beautiful thing. Even in the bundus, you get married now, all of a sudden, you don't. One year goes by, no kids. 
two years go, no, not even one year. Three months to six months, they see there's no bump on your stomach, something going on. Here. What's going on with that woman? How come she's not she's not falling pregnant? They never question, they never question the man. What will Mpopo and all that? They, the man is never questioned. Because Esau will say, no, you have a low sperm count. That's Esau's witchcraft. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a low sperm count. That's Esau's witchcraft because they cannot have kids. What we're reading here is, it says what our foremother Sarah was excited. She was happy that she was able to conceive. In the Bundus, when you get married, three months, three months to six months, they don't see nothing. Hmm. They start to talk about you. Just like Penina was talking about, was talking against our foremother Hannah before she gave birth to Samuel. Guess what? That's the same thing today. So you better take heed to this thing that's coming out this day. Understand that thing. Now, let's move on to the next wave of feminism. Uh, that's all I want on here. Mm. El Salvador, that's our people right there. You know what? Wait. Let's read that. The things that they're having a problem with. Okay? These are the feminists now. Feminist movement, wave two. Read that. The problem. Reading from amnesty.org. The problem. New threats to equality and our lives. Many of the recent advances made by brave activists are now under threat. Mm -hmm. In December 2013, India's Supreme Court ruled that same-sex relations between consenting adults would remain a criminal offense. Within con what consenting what? Can we, you, what English are you brothers speaking? Could you read that again? In December 2013, India's Supreme Court ruled that same-sex relations between consenting adults would remain a criminal offense. Within consenting adults would remain a criminal offense. So in India, same sex is a criminal offense. Keep reading. In January 2014, the deeply oppressive same-sex marriage prohibition right act. You, you, see, you see that part right there? It says the deeply oppressive. You see the emphasis? The deeply oppressive same-sex marriage. Same sex, there's no marriage that is between a man and a man. That's not a marriage. Between a woman and a woman, that's not a marriage. There's no such thing in the Bible as a same-sex marriage. Marriage is between man and woman, male and female. Same sex is not a marriage. That's a what? That's an abomination in the sight of the Most High. Read that thing again. In January 2014, the deeply oppressive same-sex marriage prohibition act became law in Nigeria. All praises to the Lord for that thing. Go ahead. In January 2014, a new abortion law came into effect in Ireland. The Protection of Life During Pregnancy Act, which continues to criminalize and punish abortion with a 14-year prison sentence. Ah, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing right there. This is beautiful. South Africa will never do it because you've got simps as presidents. They just set up puppet kings. They don't have no backbone. I don't know how they bend to tie their shoes. Okay, let's go back. Let's look at the fourth wave, the next wave of feminism. Hmm. Let's deal with the third wave now. The third wave of feminism. That one right there. This is the third wave. Okay, read that. Reading from the, the humanist.com. Third wave feminism emerged from the mid 1990s, challenging female heteronormativity. Third wavers sought to redefine femininity and mm. sought to celebrate differences across race, class, and sexual orientations. So now it says they sought to celebrate the differences across race. Remember, in the second wave, they brought the black woman in. Now, in the third wave, now they are celebrating, it says, they celebrate differences across race, class, and sexual orientations. You see what they are introducing now in the third wave? Sexual orientation, which will be which will be more prevalent in the fourth wave. But they are introducing it, you understand, slowly. 
but which it will become more dominant in the fourth wave. So race, class, and sexual orientations. Keep reading, go ahead. While third wave feminists support feminism, they reject many stereotypes of the feminine ideal, sometimes even rejecting the word feminism itself. Mm -hmm. This movement was a stark departure from the second wave and the development of intersectionality began to take form. Go ahead. The term intersectionality was coined by lawyer and activist Cambry Crenshaw to describe how race, class, gender, and other individual characteristics intersect with one another and overlap. They do what? intersect with one another and overlap. So now the third wave, when you look at this third wave of feminism, right? The third wave of feminism, there's a, there's a cross-pollination of different races, meaning what? What has ESO has done in the third wave? Hmm. Give me the book. Give me the book of First Maccabees 1. I'm going to show you what ESO has done in the third wave of feminism. Because remember, in the second wave, they brought the Black women in. Now the third wave, they are bringing everybody, all the minority races and so forth, they are bringing them in into this thing. So they started with them, they lead by the quote-unquote lead by example, then they bring the black women in, then they bring other people in. They start to extend their hand to people, places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, China, India, you understand, Japan, also all over the place, the continent of Africa and so forth. Mm -hmm. First markup is one. Read verse 41. First Maccabees chapter 1, verse 41. Mm -hmm. Moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people. And everyone should leave his lords. So all the heathen agreed according to the commandment of the king. You see that? More is Antiochus is a listen. We're going to introduce democracy. All nations under one. They are all going to follow Greek culture and Greek religions. Meaning what? You are going to be assimilated into Greek culture. It was during the time of the Hellenistic period. That's what they call it in the history. You understand? Greek culture and ideas. Read on. Yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion. Mm -hmm. and sacrificed unto idols and profaned the Sabbath. Idolatry is always the main characteristics of these movements. Idolatry. Look at the Tower of Babel. Idolatry. Idolatry was always part of the plan all the time. So what Antiochus is doing here, he brought in the Israelites and he brought all the other races together to agree with his system of oppression, his system of going against what the Bible is saying. So the third wave of feminism is what? is to bring all races to what? To do what? To push the things that they introduced in the second wave, to push the things that they introduced in the first wave. The first wave was white women, middle aged and upper class white women that wanted to be equal with their white men. Guess what? The white men had to allow them to do it. But guess what? They are still with their men. The second wave, they brought in the black women. But when they brought in the black women, they separated the black women from the black men. So that inclusion of the black woman into the second wave of, the, of feminism was to destroy the black family structure. You understand? The third wave is now everybody's getting involved in this thing. Chinese, Indians, Arabs, and whatnot, they are all partaking. They are pushing all this sexuality. You understand? Sexual orientation, okay? Um, sexual and reproductive rights, where you have a right to, to your body as a woman, even when you are married. When you are not married, you are the property of your father. Let me say that again in case I started. When you are not married, you are the property of your father until your father gives your hand in marriage to that man of understanding. That's it. The white men don't, don't believe that. I don't give a damn what the white man thinks. I only care what the most High God says. Watch this. Give me that in Tobit 7 verse 13 that I may be justified in what I'm saying. Tobit 7 verse 13. From your father's house, you go to your husband's house. That's the law. We watch God. Chapter 7, verse 13.
Tobit chapter 7 verse 13. Go ahead. Then he called his daughter Sarah mm -hmm. and she came to her father Wait. and he took her by the hand and gave her to be wife to Tobias saying, behold, take her after the law of Moses and lead her away to thy father. And he blessed them. You see that thing? So before she was given it to Tobias to be a wife, she was under her father's roof. The, the parents were preparing her for marriage. They were not preparing her to be a girlfriend, neither were they allowing her to date, to be dating any boy, because that's whoredom in the sight of the Most High. We don't allow that because it's against our laws that the Most High God, the Heavenly Father, the God of Israel, gave unto us to implement in our households and to build up our nation. You understand? This thing of boyfriend and girlfriend is the reason why the black poor community is so destroyed. Mjolo must fall. And our job, Operation Mjolo must fall. I want you brothers that are doing this social media stuff, you must put a hashtag. We need to put a trending topic. Mjolo must fall. We must even put a banner up. I need you brothers to jump on that thing. Mjolo must definitely fall. And marriage must be exalted and honored as it was in the days of old. We're bringing the flavor back in the spirit of Christ. Okay, now the third wave of feminism is what is what we read in First Maccabees one. Now let's read the fourth wave of feminism. You know what? Hmm. Hold on a second. Hey, let me see if I want to go over because I've got a lot of stuff to add that I want to cover. This is most definitely part one. Okay. Hmm. You know what? I want to go back to that third wave. No, to that. Is it the third wave? Second wave. Because the second wave also translates all to the certain things in the third wave that are taken from the third wave. You understand? Because the second wave that brought the black woman, the third wave, that's your sexuality and whatnot and all of that, meaning you choose reproductive rights and all of that. So, watch this. I'm going to show you something here. Hmm. Because when you are married, you are pregnant, you can decide, I don't want the baby, okay? You can terminate the baby. You don't even have to tell your husband, okay? You don't have to, because I went over this in terms of the abortions and all that. I want to read it again. Read that, abortion in South Africa. I want you to touch that because this goes for married and unmarried women. Let me show you what the Constitution, the Choice on Termination of Pregnancy Act of 92, 1996, what it says, which was implemented in 97 on 1st of Feb. We watch God. Read that, abortion in South Africa. Abortion in South Africa, reading from wikipedia.org. Mm -hmm. Abortion in South Africa is legal on request during the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. The and first 12 under weeks, it says, hold on. It says, is legal on request during the first 12 weeks of pregnancy you can get an abortion on request. That translates into abortion on demand. The first 12 weeks, okay? So the first three months of your pregnancy, you can request for your baby to be put to death because that's what abortion is, murder. Go ahead. And under certain conditions afterwards. Meaning abortion. under certain, hold on. Under certain conditions after the 12 weeks, Meaning after the three months, that means three months plus, you can still do an abortion. That's what they are telling you. Go ahead. Abortion is provided free at government hospitals. Mm. And a telemedical or pills by post service is provided by Mary Stokes, South Africa. An abortion clinic, Johannesburg. So Mary Stokes, that demonic company called Mary Stokes, an abortion clinic, Johannesburg, they say they can provide telemedical abortion or pills they, that will be sent by post. This is evil right here. So that means your daughter can just pick up the phone. She will have sex, she for pregnant, she pick up the phone, she call Mary Stokes or abortion clinic Johannesburg, they just send the pills and she takes them, she bleeds and then she just kills the baby. Because that pill will, will, will kill the baby and shrink the baby into blood and she just be have blood, blood coming out of it. That's the dead body. You can't make it up yet. Keep reading. Abortion was legal 
only under very limited circumstances until 1st February 1997. When the Choice on Termination of Pregnancy Act, Act 92 of 1996 came into force, provide abortion on demand for a variety of cases. So now, abortion on demand, the choice of termina on termination of pregnancy, it became that ab it, that's abortion on demand. It says it came into force. So when did this happen? It says 1996, right? Let's see. Which political party vetoed the bill to make sure the bill come into, into, into fruition? Let's see. The choice, choice on termination of pregnancy, Act 1996. Read that. Choice on termination of pregnancy, Act 1996. Reading from Wikipedia.org. Okay, Read. Read. The Choice on Termination of Pregnancy, Act 1996, Act number 92 of 1996 is the law governing abortion in South Africa. Go ahead. It allows abortion on demand up to the 12th week of pregnancy under broadly specified circumstances from the 30th to the 20th week. And only for serious medical reasons after the 20th week. You see, they're trying to be slick. You see, they are trying to be slick. Give me that in Psalms 96. Give me, no, give me Psalms, give me Psalms 90, 94, Psalms 94 verse 20. They are trying to, they are being very slick because they are telling you, hey, they said the first 12 weeks, which is the first three months of your pregnancy, you can abort your baby. Yes, says uh, circumstances from the 13th week to the 20th week. So three months plus, you see that thing, 20 weeks. Twenty weeks. That's more than five months. Play, play. You can have an abortion five to six months plus of pregnancy. You can have an abortion. Watch this. And the reason why they want to throw you off and says, and only for serious medical reasons after the twentieth week. So what are they telling you? Even twenty weeks later, you can still have an abortion. That's what they are telling you under the Choice on Termination of Pregnancy Act, 1996, in South Africa, okay? Psalms 94, verse 20. Let me show you how slick they are. Read it. Psalms 94, verse 20, come on. Psalms 94, verse 20. Mm -hmm. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth yeah. mischief by law? You see that? Which frameth mischief by a law. So the choice on termination of pregnancy act, that's the law. But this law frames mischief. What is the mischief? Murder, that it legalized murder. The choice on termination of pregnancy act is legalized murder. They're giving our, our sisters license to kill. And they hide under this act that they set up. Okay, now, jump down, the history. Let's read that part right there when it says, the choice on termination of pregnancy. Read that part right there. The choice on termination of pregnancy act was introduced in the first post-apartheid parliament. Mm. It Hold implemented- on. Wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. It says the choice on termination of pregnancy act was introduced in the first post-apartheid government. The post-apartheid government is the time when Mandela was the president, 1994. That's why is the act, the Choice on Termination of Pregnancy Act, Act number what, 92 of 1996, two years after Mandela was the president. Okay, let's keep that in mind, because they like to say, no, do it for Mandela. No, during his, during his, during his office as the president, this is what took place. Read. It implemented the statement in the governing African National Congress's policy framework that every woman must have the right to choose whether or not to have an early termination of pregnancy according to her own beliefs. So according to the ANC policy framework is that every woman has the right to kill her baby. That's what he's saying. Every woman must have the right to choose whether or not to have an early termination of pregnancy according to her own beliefs. 
meaning according to her own feelings, she can kill the baby. I don't feel like it. I don't feel like I want to be a mother. She can go to um, Mary Stopes or the what? He says the, what is that place? The abortion clinic, Jobek. She can go there and kill the baby. You understand? Because of how she feels. This is the ANC's policy framework, by the way. I want you to keep that in mind. This is ANC's policy framework to give our black women license to kill. Keep reading. Although it was requested that parliament members be allowed to vote according to their personal beliefs, the ruling party ruled that its own members may not vote against the act. You see what they and did? They, they said, no, no, no. They said, listen, although every parliament member must vote according to their own personal beliefs, but in this instance, everybody was forced to vote to support this act, meaning they were forced to do it. Keep reading. And the act passed by 209 votes to 87. Five abstained, 99 were absent. Mm. It came into force on 1st February, 1997. You see, they keep saying that. It says it came into force. This was not a request. You see, it's letting you know this was coming from up top. It was coming from up to, because remember, we are a shadow um, Democrats. You understand? We are a shadow Democrats. Babe. We are controlled by our colonial masters. That's what they are trying to, that's what they are telling. We don't own ourselves as a country yet. You understand? But the part I wanted to talk, I wanted to go into is that wave of feminism when it says reproductive and sexual rights, Hmm. I want to go into it again. Legal stance. This legal position. Yeah, let's read that. Okay. Legal position. Reading from wikipedia.org. In South Africa, a woman of any age can get an abortion no, no. on... Hold on. Yeah, that part we read. I want you to read this part right there. This one. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. The right to life. Okay. No, this part. A woman under the age of 18. Read that part. A woman under the age of 18 will be advised to consult her parents. Mm -hmm. But she can decide not to inform or consult them if she so chooses. So she's under 18. Remember the, the age of consent in South Africa in terms of women having sex is 16 years old. That's some evil stuff. You understand? It says a woman under the age of 18 will be advised. She's not forced, she'll just be advised. No, it's just a suggestion to consult her parents, but she can decide not to inform or consult them if she so chooses. Meaning, guess what? She's, she, they're not going to do it. They don't do it. They don't even ask, did you talk to your parents? They don't ask when they have to rip these babies out of our sister's stomachs. We don't. A woman who is married or in a life partner relationship will be advised to consult her partner. But she can decide not to inform or consult him or her. You see that? That's some evil stuff. Is as a woman who is married in a life partner relationship that's just bumping and grinding will be advised to consult her partner, but she can decide not to inform or consult with him. Because lesbians don't get pregnant until there's a man involved. So we're just gonna read that part, the him. It says, listen, there's no, you don't have to inform your husband that you deciding to kill the baby while you're pregnant with his baby. The, the government is telling you that you can, even if you're, even when you are married, you don't have to tell your husband. You can just go and kill the baby and come home with a flat stomach. That's what they're saying. And remember, this is ANC's policy framework that every woman has a right to do whatever the hell she wants with her body, as if that body belongs to her. Get that in 1 Corinthians 6, 19.
by the way, this Tries on Termination of Pregnancy Act, this is part of the third wave of feminism. Don't lose the point now. Don't lose the thought. We're still dealing with the third wave. I wanted to backtrack a little bit to deal with the abortion as part of it, married or unmarried. Guess what? You can still decide. I'm not going to tell my husband. Okay? Read that, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, mm -hmm. which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. No, I thought every woman is that that's their own body. That body belongs to them. Read that part again. Ye are not your own. You are not your own. Your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to them to to the Most High God that made that body. Give me that in Second um, Maccabees seven verse twenty two. I'm going to show you that that body don't belong to you. Over and above that, the baby inside of you, you are not responsible for forming the limbs in that baby. The most high God is responsible for doing that. So guess what? When these, our sisters, they kill these children that they are carrying, guess what? That's murder. Because if you as a man, you kill a, pre like right now there's a case. Um, I don't condone that. I don't condone what that demonic, Black Ash demon did to that sister, our sister Tirufazopuli. She killed the sister when the sister was pregnant. That's double homicide. She was eight months pregnant. The Negro put the sister to death and she was hanged. That's double homicide. You understand? Watch this. Second Maccabees 7, verse 22. I'm going to show you something. Second Maccabees chapter 7, verse 22. Hmm. Read that. Second Maccabees chapter 7, verse 22. Go ahead. I cannot tell how he came into my womb. Mm -hmm. For I neither gave you breath nor life, neither was it I that formed the members of every one of you. You see what you see what she's saying? This is our foremother during the time of the Greeks. She had seven sons. She's explaining to them: listen, I cannot tell you how you came into my womb. For I neither gave you breath nor life, because the Lord is the one that does it. Neither was I that formed the members of every one of you, meaning your limbs, your head, your arms, your legs, and so on, your spine. Go ahead. But doubtless the creator of the world who formed the generation of men and found out the beginning of all things will also of his own mercy give you breath and life again as ye now regard not your own selves for his lost sake. You see that thing? So she's explaining that, listen, I, I'm not the one that did this. The Lord is the one that did it. You understand that? She understood that. A righteous black woman, but these unrighteous black as she Jezebels out here, they just go around, just be killing our kids. And the government is giving them rights to do it. You understand? But we stand with what God says. You understand? The most high God is not about that. The most high God is not in support of that. Neither do we. We don't support that. Because now they try to say, no, it's not a baby yet. It's a fetus. Read the first paragraph. I'm going to show you the hypocrisy in the white man's system and the black, our black brothers and sisters in parliament, you understand? They support the serpent still until this day. Read the first paragraph. I'm going to show you something. Legal abortion. Mm. In South Africa, a woman of any age can get an abortion on request with no reasons given if she is less than 13 weeks pregnant. Meaning of if, any age. She, of any age, she don't have to give no reason. Go ahead. If she is between 13 and 20 weeks pregnant, she can get the abortion if A, her own physical or mental health is at stake. How, do, how would they know that? It says her own physical or mental health is at stake. Because guess what? Whatever she's, it says she doesn't have to give no reason. That's the first line tells you. So these options that they're giving you here is to throw you off. The first statement tells you they don't have to give no reason to kill. Keep reading. B, the baby will have severe mental or physical abnormalities. You see that part right there? You see that second one, that number B? 
when it says the baby will have severe mental or physical abnormalities, that's the same reason reasoning they give to our sisters when they go to these the hospitals to give birth. They to convince them to do a C-section. These are the stuff that they tell them. Read on. C, she is pregnant because of incest. She is pregnant because of incest. Listen, that's 0.9%. That's, that's 0.99% of the cases that are happening because of incest. Read on. D, she is pregnant because of rape. That falls under that, 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 that number C. Go ahead. Or E, she is of the personal opinion that her economic or social situation is sufficient reason for the termination of pregnancy. You see that part right there. She is of the personal opinion. This is her feelings. It's got nothing to do with it. No, no, her feelings. You know why? When it says personal opinion, that means I still want to live my life. Economic or social situation, I don't want the people to see that I'm pregnant. That means my sexual marketplace now is no longer, is non-existent. Men are not going to look at me with my big stomach because I'm pregnant. He economic, whatever. No, I still want to go to school. I still want to do this. I'm not ready to be a mother yet. That's the, these are the reasons they give. That's the same reasons that we in are giving for parliamenting. That's the same ones. That's the same reason they are pushing for comprehensive sex education. I'm going to deal with that. Keep reading. Not today, though. Lord's will. Read. If she is more than 20 weeks pregnant, she can get the abortion only if her or the fetus's life is in danger. Hmm. Or they are likely to be serious birth defects. That part right there. You see that he says she can get the abortion only if her or the fetus's life is in danger. Is it? That's what they say again. They say, no, it's not a, it's not a life. It's not a baby yet. No, it's a fetus. But they're saying the fetus is life. They are, you see, they are telling on themselves right there. They are letting you know that it's a life inside of her. Let's see what God has to say about that thing. Get Exodus 21, verse 22. Exodus 21, 20. let's see the law, okay? Exodus chapter 21, verse 22. Go ahead. If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that mm -hmm. her fruit depart from her, and Meaning yet she has a miscarriage, Miscarriage. Men are fighting to get them. Men are fighting, and the woman gets hurt in the process. Who's pregnant? He says, and her food, her fruit depart from her, which is what the baby, meaning she has a miscarriage, and so forth. Go ahead. So that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow. He shall be surely punished, according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he meaning shall what? pay I'm, as the judges. Uh, according according to the woman's husband, because the woman, the husband now a pregnant wife who was pregnant, that's what it says, a fruit depart, the fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow me. She's still alive. He shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, meaning the father will decide what must happen to this guy. He's the one that will decide. But the judges obviously will make the final decision based on the case. Read on. And he shall pay as the judges determine. Mm -hmm. Read. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Read again verse 23. Exodus chapter 21 verse 23. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. You see that thing? If any mischief follow, it says, thou shalt give life for life. So that fetus, that's a life in there. That is a life right there. You says you shall give life for life. Because that's a life. You understand? So you sisters that are married, you don't want to fall pregnant. These are the options that the white man has given unto you because that's part of the feminist movement. And if the husband is to take you to court, there's nothing they're gonna do. They're gonna they're gonna defend it because they're gonna say, but according to the Choice on Termination of Pregnancy Act, 
she has a right whether she doesn't want to have a baby or not. You see that thing? Hmm. Keep that in mind. Understand that. Okay, let's read the fourth wave now for me. Let's read that. Fourth wave. Fourth wave feminism is newly emerging over the last decade or so. Therefore, it's difficult to define. No, it's not difficult That's to define. I'm going to show you that. They're going to explain to you. He says it's difficult to define because they are trying to throw you off. Keep reading. That said, fourth wave feminism is seen as characterized by action-based viral campaigns. Hey, what? Whoa, 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 hold on. By what? By action-based viral campaigns. Is that the fourth wave of feminism is characterized by action-based viral campaigns, meaning things that you're going to see, meaning major protests that you're going to see on the streets every year. You understand? Keep reading. Protests and movements like hashtag me too, advancing from the fringes of society into the headlines of our everyday news. You see that the me too movement, you know, men and women saying they are coming out. I think that's how they say it. I'm coming out. Keep reading. Go ahead. The fourth wave has also been characterized as queer. Here we go. Sex Hold on. You see that? Here we That's it right there. Is that the fourth wave has also been characterized as queer. That's the Q in the LGBTQ. Keep reading. Sex positive. Mm. Trans inclusive. Body positive and digitally driven. Mm. It seeks to further deconstruct gender norms. That's it, that part right there. So the fourth wave of feminism, is objective is to deconstruct gender norms. What is gender norms? It goes into what? Gender fluid. I'm gender fluid. You see that thing? The fourth wave is to deconstruct gender norms, meaning what? They, let, me, let me show you the article, actually. Let's, let's go into the article. They want to deconstruct gender norms, right? Let's see what that means. Deconstruct gender norms. Watch this. This is the article. Um, read, that, read that part right there. Adolescent sexual and reproductive health rights Section what? Section 27. This is section 27 of the constitution of South Africa. Now watch this. Read that part right there. What are sexual and reproductive health rights? SRHR. So sexual and reproductive health rights. We touched on that. Read on. Which rights are fundamental to the realization of SRHR? Go ahead. What are the components of SRHR? Read. Key sexual and reproductive health rights issues for young people. That part right there. Read that part again. Key sexual and reproductive health rights issues for young people. Young people, this goes into comprehensive sex education. Key sexual and reproductive health rights issues for young people. What do, have, what do young people have to do with um, sexual and reproductive health rights? They're supposed to be what? If it's boys, they're supposed to be learning how to use a spade, how to do the garden, how to look after the sheep, how to do um, you know, laborers work. They see the young girls, their job is to do what? Learn how to clean, how to cook, how to sew, how to wash, all of that. They must learn those things. Those are important skills to learn. Not be concerned with, um, with TikTok where black women are twerking their behinds, wearing tight pants and skinny jeans and, mink and skimpy skirts and bum shorts, showing off their cleavage, disrespecting their fathers and their brothers and their husbands. That's what they are pushing. You understand? Now read that. Sex and what? Sex, gender, 
and sexual orientation. Now let's go up. Now read that. This is the SRHR rights. Read that part right there. This one. In South Africa. In South Africa, sexual and reproductive health rights are enshrined in section 27 of the constitution, which provides that everyone has the right to have access to healthcare services, including reproductive health care. You see that? Read on. Everyone in South Africa has a right of access to services and the freedom to make free and responsible decisions and choices about their own body. That part right there, about their own body. But what about the body of the child that they are carrying well when they are pregnant? What rights do they have? Do they just get put to death because it's not a life, it's a fetus? No, the Bible tells you, you must give life for life. That's a life right there in Zaruf. What about the rights of that that? That, that, that child that is in your stomach. We are the voice, we speak for them because nobody's speaking for the, for the child and the kids that are being put to death by these black women and the government is giving them the carte blanche to do it. They are hiding behind what? Mischief by a law that they've set up in this country. Okay, watch this. Hmm. Look at, look, just look at the, the, the depiction. You see this thing right there? Look at that right there. Uh-huh. Now I'm gonna show you something. The one that I want to focus on is... Yes, this part right here. I want you to read this gender. Let me just... Uh, enlarge it a little bit. Oh, there we go, all praises. Now read that, sex, gender, and sexual orientation. Read that. Sex, gender, and sexual orientation. Often- Okay, come on. Often the three concepts of sex, gender, and sexuality are confused and are seen to be overlapping. It is easy to see why this is so. We hope that by reading this section, you will be able to distinguish between the differences of these three terms. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. When people refer to someone's sex, also called biological or physical sex, they are talking about the biological characteristics that identify you as male, female, or intersex at birth. You see that thing? What, what is the confusion? They are called creating confusion. You see, the white man is about confusion. It says sex, gender, and sexual orientation. These are all different things. They are, that the, the reason why they are writing this article is to clarify to those that are confused. Sex, gender, sexual orientation is the same thing because your sex determines your gender. We know male or female, there's no any other thing. It's just male or female. If you are a man, you'll deal with a woman. If you are a woman, you'll deal with a man. That's it. All this mumbo jumbo garbage is to confuse our people that hate the laws of God. Read that part again. When people refer to someone's what? When people refer to someone's sex, also called biological or physical sex, they are talking about the biological characteristics that identify you as male, female, or intersex at birth. So they say also called a biological or physical sex. So there's, that means if there's biological or physical sex, that means there's another one outside of these. That's what they're saying. If they have to emphasize it like this, that they are letting you know there's, there's other sex types outside of the biological one, the physical one. There's another one outside of these. Go back to Mark 10 verse 6. It is the Sabbath day. All praises to the Lord this day. Mark 10, verse 6. They are letting you know there's another one outside of this, which there is none. There's none of it. It's only male and female. That's it. Mark 10, verse 6 again. So we see what happened at the beginning. Mark chapter 10, verse 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made the male and female. From the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. That's it. 
get the book of Genesis 13, 13. Genesis chapter 13, verse 13. Because the evil that was going on during the time of Genesis is the evils that are going on today in these last days. We would you go. Genesis chapter 13, verse 13. Mm -hmm. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. You see what the Bible is telling you? The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before God, before the Lord exceedingly. No meaning what? They were going outside of the bounds of normalcy to fulfill their sexual lusts. Give me Jude verse 7. Jude verse 7. Okay. Jude verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and mm -hmm. going after strange flesh. That's what we're reading here. It's all on. Wait, 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 wait. It says, giving themselves over to fornication. This thing of a man sleeping with another man, that's fornication. They violate the laws of marriage. You understand? A man sleeping with a woman sleeping with another woman, lesbianism, they're violating the laws of marriage. You understand? Because they are going after strange flesh. A man sleeping with another man, he's going after strange flesh and he gets his bum abused by another man. Read that thing again, verse 7. Jude, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. If they don't repent, that's the judgment that's going to come. Eternal fire, the vengeance of eternal fire. Read on. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile mm. the flesh. You see that? It says, likewise, these filthy dreamers, because they are going after strange flesh. That's a filthy dream. That's what the Lord is telling you. Because what is based upon lust and fornication and sexual desire has got nothing to do with marriage, according to God. Men and women, male and female. Read on. Despise dominion. They hate the and, order of God. They hate the order that the Lord has set up through his laws. Read on. And speak evil of dignities. They speak evil of dignities. They speak evil of what? The laws of God. They speak evil of that because they want to fulfill their own evil and abominable sexual desires. That's why now they say sex, gender, and sexual orientation, they are all different things. Basically, what are they doing? They are educating the people to accept this garbage. Go back to the article. Biological characteristics include reproductive organs. For example, uterus, testicles, vagina, and penis, genes and hormones. Intersex is when someone is born with biological characteristics that are ambiguous. Stop meaning right there. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait. It says intersex, because remember in the beginning it says. Um, is that they are talking about the biological characteristics that identify you as male, female, or intersex at birth. Is now the bottom part of this paragraph, they are explaining the intersex part. So read that part, intersex is when what? Intersex is when someone is born with biological characteristics that are ambiguous. Meaning, such characteristics are not distinctly or typically female or male. You see that thing? They are not typically female or male. So they are letting you know that the most I will make mistakes. That's what they are telling you. That's some evil stuff. That's the devil. This is Esau's. This is the white man speaking through the black man or the black woman who wrote this article. The government a simp in office right now. Next part of next paragraph. Your biological what? Your biological sex is not the same as your gender identity. You can't make this stuff up. Confusion. 
your biological sex is not the same as your gender identity. Oh my God, man. Read that part right there. I want you to read that. Gender non-binary, meaning what? Is not male or female, meaning it's something else. That's why they call it gender fluid. Read that part. Yeah, yeah. Let's read the paragraph. There are more gender identities. There are more gender identities than just as a man or a woman. <laughs> man, you cannot make this stuff up. This is what we're reading here right now. This is the fourth wave of feminism. So guess what? When you hear, when you hear, especially I'm getting on the sisters, the sisters, you are, you are feminists. A feminist is a, being a feminist is a gateway to lesbianism. Let me say that again in case I started. Feminism is the gateway to, um, is the, if you're a sister, of course, because we talk about feminism. Feminism is the gateway to lesbian veil. Understand, we went through all these waves to arrive here the fourth wave of feminism. Feminism is the gateway to lesbianism. And there's no, understand that, that's what we're reading here. Because it's idolatry, which leads to adultery. It's the same thing. You understand? Hmm. I'm gonna show you something. Give me the book of Deuteronomy 31, because what we're reading here says, there are more gender identities than just a man or a woman. Really? Is that right? Hmm. Let's hear what God has to say. The maker of heaven and earth. Let's see what he has to say about this, this stuff. Okay. Deuteronomy 31. We can read now. Deuteronomy 31 and verse, read verse 12. Let's see if there's more than just man or woman. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 12. Gather the people together, men and women and children. Stop and right there. Hold on, no, no. You don't, you, need, you don't need to go no further. It says, gather the people together, men and women and children. That's it. Men and women, when they get married, they have sex, they, they beget children. That's it. And that children, that child is what where it, where it will be, whether male or female. Excuse me, you understand? Is that simple? And who decides the sex? Let's see, get Genesis 16. Who decides that? Because right here, the white man is the one that is telling the people what, no, gender, sex, and or sexual orientation is not the same thing. Okay, watch this. Genesis 16 and verse 11. Genesis chapter 16, verse 11. Uh -huh. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and oh, right shalt there. bear... Hold on, wait, wait, wait. It says, the angel of the Lord said unto her, talking to Hagar, it says, thou art with child. First thing, the angel is telling this woman, you are pregnant. Okay. That's what that it says. You are pregnant. That's number one. Next verse. Next part of that verse. Read on. Thou art with child, and shall bear a son. Stop right there. You are pregnant, and you're gonna give birth to a son. So the angel of the Lord is getting information from the Most High. Is moving in the spirit of Christ to know you are pregnant before you even know you are pregnant. Secondly, the gender of the child is decided by the Most High God. Whether it's male or female, the Lord already knows. That's why it says, before I formed thee in thy belly, I knew thee. I knew that you are going to be born and you are going to be a man or a female. The Lord knows that. Now the white man is coming up with his new garbage to push this stuff on the, on the nation of Israel, which is us this day. That's the reason why you are seeing this. Okay? That's not biblical. This is the imagination of men. Okay, read that. We're not going to read the whole thing, but I'll send the article. You can read the whole thing on your own. Okay, read it. 
There are more gender identities than just as a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. These include transgender and gender non-binary, also called gender fluid or gender queer. You see that? Gender fluid or gender queer. This is the fourth wave of feminism. Go ahead. Transgender is an umbrella term for persons whose identity, gender expression, or behavior does not conform to that typically associated with the sex to which they were assigned at birth. Mm. Meaning one, it's got nothing to do with the physical sex which the Lord gave you. It's got everything to do with how you feel in your wicked mind. Go ahead. Gender non-binary is the category for someone with gender identities that shift between feeling like a man or a woman. Whoa, 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 read that part again. He says what? <laughs> gender oh non-binary uh -huh. is a category for someone with gender identities that shift between feeling like a man or a woman. So it keeps shifting all the time. One minute you feel like a man, then okay, I'm a man now. One minute you feel like a woman, okay, I'm a woman now. Guess what that's called? This right here is called role reversals in the black community. Because in the black community, because this is not our culture. This thing of gayness, gay, homosexuality, lesbian, that's not our culture. We don't do stuff like that. We frown upon stuff like that. But in the, in the white men, the white men, the Caucasians, they don't frown upon that because that's their culture. Homosexuality and lesbianism, that's their culture. Keep reading. That's Greek and Roman culture. Where someone closely perceives themselves as both a man and a woman is regarded as by gender. A person who does not identify with gender is regarded as a gender. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, man, just evil stuff. Yeah. This is all evil. Okay, read the highlighted part. Gender what? Gender expression is about how you appear to others. You see that thing? How you appear to others. So a child, when the child is a boy, they are playing with their mother's shoes, they are wearing their dress, you must smack that child to stop doing that. You understand? Because they're gonna grow up, they will be emboldened in that eve. Next part of that uh, paragraph, uh, sexual orientation is what? Sexual orientation also is not the same as biological sex or gender. Okay, that's it on that. That is it on that. I just wanted to show you because that's what we read in the article in the fourth wave. They were talking about what? Being gender fluid, queer. queer. Yeah, it says I'm queer. Mm -hmm. Gender fluid. Read the fourth wave of feminism again. Reading from the humanist.com. Mm -hmm. Fourth wave feminism is newly emerging over the last decade or so. Really? Therefore, it's difficult to define. That said, fourth wave feminism is seen as characterized by action-based viral campaigns, protests, and movements like hashtag Me Too, advancing from the fringes of society into the headlines of our everyday news. The fourth wave has also been characterized as queer, sex positive, so queer means gender fluid. It based on how you feel, it moves from one gender to another, male or female, gender fluid. Go ahead. Sex positive, trans inclusive, body positive, and digitally driven. Mm. It seeks to further deconstruct gender norms. You see that, that's what we were reading in that article to deconstruct gender norms. That's why we went to that article in the first place, to show you the deconstruction of gender norms. Read on. The problem these feminists confront is systematic. White, white male supremacy. He says the problem these feminists confront is systemic white male supremacy. Because what? You see, they are, they are making it seem like is just the white man put no no his white woman is also doing the same thing the problem these feminists confront is a systemic white male supremacy so meaning what they hate patriarchy but they come from men 
You can't make it up, yeah. The reason why they, they cannot see that is because of the lust that is driving them. That's why they can't see that. Read on. Fourth waivers believe there is no feminism without an understanding of comprehensive justice that deconstructs systems of power and includes emphasis on racial justice as well as examinations of class, disability, and other issues. That's a lie. That right there, that's a lie. Because when you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, Pella, the, the founder of the Black Lives Matter movement is a black woman who's married to Amalek, a lesbian woman. So Black Lives Matter is to deconstruct gender norms and to destroy the black family. You understand? So that, that movement was hijacked by the LGBT XYZ community. Then the civil rights movement was also hijacked by the second wave of feminism when they brought the black woman in to join the white woman's problem to fight against her white man. But the white woman is still with the white man. The black woman is separated from the black man. You see that thing? This whole, these, all, the, all these movements, their job is to destroy the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what I want you to understand. This whole thing is to destroy the 12 tribes of Issa. It's got nothing to do with anything else. It's to push the agenda, but the main agenda is to destroy the 12 tribes of the nation of Issa. You understand? Give me that in Psalms 31, okay? This whole thing is to destroy the 12 tribes. Understand, because they know our people is lost and confused, so it's easy to, conf to, to confuse our people with... with um, with all these evils because they know our people were not keeping the laws as a nation. So it's easy to, de to deceive our people who don't read this book and they don't know who they are. Psalms 31 verse four, watch this. This is the prayer we all must have. Okay, come on. Psalms chapter 31 verse four. Pray. Pull me out of the nets that they have laid privily for me. For thou art my strength. You see that thing? David is praying in the spirit and said, listen, he says, pull me out of the, what, the net that they have laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. The Lord is our strength. We must pray for the most high to pull us out of the traps that society has set for us, particularly the white man, the white woman, the, the other nations that support them. Read on, verse 5. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. You see that thing? The Most High will redeem us out of these evils that they've said privily for us. Give me the book of Job. I'm almost done. Job chapter 5. Job 5 and verse 12. But the Most High is going to disappoint all these their evil enterprises. We watch God. Come on. Job chapter 5 verse 12. He disappointed the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. You see that thing? Because the most high God, give me Isaiah 1 and 9. If it was not for the Lord raising up the remnant in these last days, all of these waves of feminism, all of us would be involved in them. But all praises to the Lord for this thing, for, the, for this truth. All praises to the most high. Okay, read that. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 9. Mm -hmm. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, really? we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. You see that thing right there? If it wasn't for that, then we would be saying we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been as Gomorrah. Because what's happening right now, the world is operating like Sodom and Gomorrah, and America is pushing that thing on the forefront. Watch this. Give me that in Revelation 11 verse 8. Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. Read. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, mm -hmm. where also our Lord was crucified. You see that thing? There is a, there, our dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city. The great city is the United States of America, Babylon the Great, which spiritually is not physical Sodom, is a spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Sodom because homosexual, homosexuality, homosexual activity is rampant 
on this earth because of America's ruling the whole earth. Homosexuality has even penetrated the Arab world. You understand? That's how, that's how, that's how, that's how, that's how prevalent and widespread it is. They've got influence all over the earth in all countries, even Muslim countries. They also have, uh, they also have what? They have influence over them as well. That's why it says spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt because we slaves, where also our Lord was crucified. I mean, the doctrine of Christ is not taught. They teach, they, they put white images out there with a white man who gave a white gay man. They say, no, that's Jesus. That's blasphemy. You understand? Jesus is a black man. Okay, watch this. Now give me Psalms, Job chapter 5 as one. Job chapter 5 verse 1. Mm -hmm. Call now, if there be any that will answer thee, and to which of the saints will thou turn? Go ahead. For breath killeth the foolish man, and mm -hmm. envy slayeth the silly one. Read that again. Job chapter 5 verse 2. For breath killeth the foolish man, and mm -hmm. envy slayeth the silly one. You see, envy slayeth the silly one. Who's the silly one? The black woman who is a black feminist going against her own nation to destroy what we're trying to build in the spirit of Christ. The Lord, this is the judgment. Sisters, that you sisters that have a feminist mindset, you better stop that. You sisters with a feminist mindset, the most High God is letting you know what you must do. Is 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 telling you what he's going to do to you if you don't repent. He says, envy slayeth the silly one. So when you envy what the white man is pushing out there in the world, because everything that the white man is pushing is to, is to destroy us. You understand? Directly and indirect. So God, the Lord is saying, envy slayeth the silly one. So when you envy your oppressor, you go after his ways, the Lord says, you are going to be slain. You will be put to death. Judgment will befall you. That's what the Lord is trying, showing us right there, that we must stay focused. We mustn't lose focus this day. All praises to the most. I'm going to end the class right there. All praises to the Lord. This is part one. This is part one right here. Let's break bread. Okay. For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed to bread, and when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the new testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 